your alternative talk radio contact, the planet, KGRARadio.com. With infinite complacency, people went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Hey guys there she is <laughs> how's it going it's going how are you shannon i'm doing good looking in the groups and i in yours the journey through the gate paranormal i saw people posting their pictures they've got the the book and of course the book that we were talking about everybody is uh something that steve stockton and cisco murdoch co-authored it is we are all children in the wilderness of the afterlife a guided tour through a haunted life and we've already talked i think about a couple of these stories uh um on last year's as a teaser if i'm not mistaken i think that you guys did yeah utilize a couple of those um yeah. and i know we've got a, a list for this evening as well so that is available of course on amazon and obviously it is available in paperback and the Kindle yes. edition, both. So go out and get that. It, it, the cover is perfect for, uh, as they say, the flavor of the book, the tone of the book. It looks fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. So proud of the cover. That's actually me. It is. <laughs> I was just going to ask who who did the cover. So it's you. It's me on the front. Yeah. Goodness that's me. Gracious. You know, just, and that's like how you feel sometimes, yeah. you know. Just like you're so overwhelmed, you know, yeah. and all the people standing behind, and yeah. it's just like I want to help these people. It makes or, sense. You know, it makes it's sense. Not even a if yeah. if anybody has ever heard Cisco's stories, you will understand what she means by "Hey, that's me on the cover," and I totally get that. So yeah, yeah, that's so cool. They they nailed it, even down to the gate for Journey of the Gate yeah. and the whole thing. It's like I've gone through the gate, man, and it's. It, it's it's beautiful. I love the way it's written. It came out great. And the good thing is, is anybody that bought the Kindle last year, it's all updated now. And you get the extra content to it. It's supposed to happen automatically. And I put, made sure that that was happening for people because I wanted my readers to have the extra content fully edited. It's beautiful. The, the paperback came out fantastic right down to the little in each beginning of the chapter has little uh, infinity signs, meaning that everything continues on. I mean, everything in that book has a meaning and it's just, I'm so proud of it. You know, we couldn't be happier with it. So well, get it. And like Amazon's doing a thing right now that if you get the paperback, you can gift the Kindle for $1.99 oh. to somebody. So that's kind of nice. That's cool. That's pretty cool, right? Are they just doing that so. for the holiday seasons or I've never heard of such a thing. That's very, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, I do not know that there's a limit. I've not been told that there's a limited time oh. on it. Uh, but for right now, it's going on right now. So that's kind of cool. So, you know, you can just gift it to somebody. Gift of Boo. I can't remember <laughs> the what the name of, of that program is, like Matchlink or something like that. But, yeah, if you buy the... The Kindle edition, you, or the the paperback edition, you can get the Kindle edition for yourself or gift it to somebody for $1.99. Cool. So that's awesome. When I yeah. was uh, I was in Ohio, I was at Seth and Adrian Breedlove's house uh, at, at the last couple days before I came back to Vegas. We had one more interview to do, uh, Seth and I, for uh, On the Trail of UFOs. And he's got a, a great bookshelf uh, downstairs and I had sat down with the book Misery by Stephen King and I had only seen the movie and I hadn't yet read the book so I started it and I got in maybe six seven pages but that's all it took and I'm like I finally need to read this book so I got it on Kindle because um for my nighttime readings uh, I like to utilize my Kindle on my phone so I am digging into Misery finally by Stephen King Good book. Uh, and it's just yeah. so nice I've got the Kindle app on my iPad 
like I said, I can read in the dark in bed yep. and I can carry like a thousand books around with me. I've exactly. always got something to read. So. And then when you pass out, you don't have to wake up and turn <laughs> the light off. I mean, I love paperback. Mm-hmm. I, I, I always will. But at night, I, I, I am guilty of utilizing the Kindle in night mode. And then when you pass out, your phone shuts off and yeah. you're good to go. You know? The only thing to be careful of, this has happened to me, I was reading on my back and dropped my iPad on my face. I I have, I've, done, <laughs> <laughs> I've done that with my phone, but I haven't, it hasn't been when I'm as, almost asleep, embarrassingly enough, and I, <laughs> I've cracked myself in the nose. I'm like, God damn, I can't believe I did that again. Just butterfingers, you know? Uh, but here we are, fourth annual. All Halloween with Steve Stockton and Cisco Murdoch. Happy Halloween, everyone. Uh, and it was fortuitous. It's going to be actual Halloween when this airs. So happy Halloween, everyone. All you. Uh, happy happy Halloween. And happy there. birthday, Steve. Yes. Oh, thank you. And uh, when yeah. you get through listening to Shannon's show, come over to my YouTube channel. I've got a 24-hour stream going on Halloween. Got a lot yep. of special things. Not going to be live for the whole thing, but it's set up to repeat. So anytime you come in, you can hear something different. Wait, you're not going to be up for 24 hours straight, Steve? Come on now. <laughs> oh, I will to be. To be the, the bumper be in between each each uh, one? <laughs> what I'm doing, I'm starting the stream at the stroke of midnight as Wednesday the 30th goes into the 31st on the yeah. East Coast. So it actually starts at 9, or 9 p.m. Pacific, and then I'm going to welcome Halloween in every time zone across the U.S. That's awesome. And then beyond that, I don't know how long I'll stay on and be live, but I'm going to have a, a loop of my stories from my YouTube channel going on. Got it set up. It's going to be really cool. Uh, don't want to give away any spoilers, but I do like it. And there's some special surprises in there too. And also, since this is going to air on Halloween, go to my Amazon page today, Steve Stockton. All three of my books are free today. That's what I do for my birthday. Ah. I give stuff away. Yeah. Strange things in the woods, more strange things in the woods in my strange world. Those are all free for the 31st only. I there also didn't know about that. Free book day, guys. I will put the link in the show notes, of course, for the book that they both co-authored. Um, and and Steve's three free books. Which, I there mean, you, go, man. you guys have been on ITF so many times. I'll try to, um, and I, I won't try. I will. I will link every single show that you guys have both been on, including the All Halloweens and Steve's uh, a, uh, Strange Thing in the Woods, Strange Things I've been on in the there Woods, a lot of and the Ve- Haunted Vegas episode. Vegas so. show. That and was fun. Did you see where that, uh, let's see, I think it was uh, KTNV ran that yes. on their uh, website. And I'm going <laughs> to put that in there too. Yeah, Steve <laughs> made the local news here. They listed me as the one video. I was like two above Jack, uh, Zach Bagans. Yeah. And I got up one morning and that video had gone nuts and it's been on there for a few months. Yeah. And I looked and for their 13 most haunted places in Vegas, they had used my video about Bally's yeah. to illustrate the article. And just, I appreciate that folks at KTNV. Thank you. It got my, like five, it's like 5,000 views or something just almost overnight. But don't you miss it here sometimes, Steve? I do. I absolutely do. I had a great time in Vegas. I've still got a lot of friends there. I just, I miss all the things there there was to do there. And I had my photography studio while I was there. Had a big time, but it just, everything got to be just such a grind with the traffic. And, you know, and so you can't have Vegas now. without tourists because then it wouldn't be Vegas. It wouldn't be anything. And just, I'd, I'd been, you know, doing lots of different things there. I was doing the photography. I was working two jobs and just, didn't really have time for anything and just needed to go up north and get my head together, as they say. <laughs> so yeah. ended up in Portland, Oregon. And it's nice here. It rains a lot. I miss the rain in Vegas. I've always loved the rain and loved being out in the rain. And I only saw it rain a couple of times while I was there. And then it would, you know, just storm, gully washer, and then stop and the ground soaks it all up. And there you go again, or it all runs off into the gullies there. But uh, I miss it, and I've, I've considered moving back there. I don't know my plans for the future right now. I've also got some reasons that I might need to go to Southern California coming up. And then I've got some things going on in other parts of the world. I may even leave the country for a few months, so mm. we'll see. Which wouldn't be a bummer. I mean, I think that uh, many of us would probably jump at the chance to move out of the country, even if it's just for a short time. It, it, yeah. It's always, or not always, it's usually uh, I, a pretty exciting experience a little adventure yeah, i traveled i backpacked through europe uh, took a gap year between high school and college and 
use that year to to see most of your most of Western Europe anyway, and a little bit of uh, Africa. Found out when I was in Spain, hey, I can take a ferry across the Strait of Gibraltar, and I'm in Morocco. So I did that. Oh. Spent a couple of weeks in Morocco, and then back in the early 2000s, I went to Southeast Asia for a year. And that again, both my parents had died, uh, buried them within 32 days of each other, and I just needed to get away. So had a friend in the Philippines that I'd gone to college with. He moved over there, loved it. He, his grandmother gave him a trip around the world for graduating college the first time. He got as far as the Philippines and just stayed there, and he's been there 20-something wow. years now. So it's it's a great place. Got a lot of friends there. And the nice thing about Southeast Asia, when you're there, it's easy to hub out. Like I could hub out of Manila. I could go to Japan. I went to Vietnam. I went to Thailand. I went to Taiwan. Uh, just Hong Kong. It's just it's all right there, and it's flights are cheap. And there's just so much creepy stories and things over there. I haven't really ever gotten into the the hauntings and legend and cryptids and things over there. And I even like to go back someday and make a documentary. There's a particular island there called the Island of the Witches, uh, Sikihor, mm. that has some interesting stories. So who knows what I'll get into. Yeah, that would be cool to do a, a doc or a, a new book uh, originating out of there. Yeah, I've got enough stories for a book, definitely already, and just go back and be that much more. They've got things that are similar to ours. They have ghosts, which they call multos, and they have the aswang, which is their version of a vampire. It separates at the waist and goes out and flies around, and it doesn't have fangs. It has mm. a sharp tongue mm. that it drinks blood with, and the only way to kill it is to find the half that's separated and pour salt in it, and then it can't rejoin. Oh, my. And they have the copray, which is very similar to the hat man. It's a, an old man with a hat and a pipe that likes to hang out in uh, mangrove trees and uh, bewitch children and steal children away if he can. Just sounds like Florida to me. I mean, some <laughs> creepy guy that hangs out in mangrove trees. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it's just Florida. <laughs> just, uh, That's just crazy. Preaching to the choir here. I oh, lived man. in Florida for a couple of years. I and love Florida. Every day on the news, you know, just something crazy yeah. going on. Yeah. It, it, Florida just can't help itself. It really just can't. And by God, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's that meme, you know, Florida man, like he's a superhero or yeah. something. Because you always see that Florida man, you know, chews face off next door neighbor. Or yeah. <laughs> it's always just the craziest, the, the, the craziest words that you can think to put together and the action words that go with it. There, there's a Florida headline for you. It'll, it, it happens true. in Florida. No offense to Florida people. I love Absolutely the state. Not. I love my love time it. there, but went from I lived there in to there. water for a while. It was gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. You know, I wouldn't mind living I mean, there someday. hundred yeah. percent. I was it's in Orlando, hot. central Florida. It's hot. It rains a lot. It's humid. Oh, hot as uh, balls there, dude. But oh, it's, God. it's think of Vegas, but with a much higher humidity. And then you get the idea. Yeah. Then as as we say, as Steve, as it's a dry heat here. Oh, know? yeah. yeah. Well, I, people used to tell me that, and I'd say, well, close your oven, stick your head in Still there. Still hot, you know. <laughs> stand in front of your yeah. hair dryer. That's dry heat. Go ahead. Yeah. You like that? <laughs> Did that feel good to you as dry well, heat? I actually got used to it. I could do 112, 115 in Vegas and not even think about it, but... Then when you move out of it, it's like, how did I endure that? You know, that's just so hot. Yeah. Today is 82. Tomorrow it would be, uh, we're going to drop about 20 degrees. It'll be 61, 62. So all of a sudden the temperature will drop. It's, it's um, winter time. Well, yeah, people don't realize that we do have frost warnings. We have to cover our plants in the winter. They're like, oh, what do you get all of 72 down? I'm like, no, we get below <laughs> freezing sometimes, you smart ass. But that's okay. I mean, it's not Ohio, but... Um, um, the last winter cold. that I was there, it snowed in Vegas. I've got pictures of the Pyramid of Luxor and the palm trees and stuff with like an inch of snow hanging off. Steve, of you would have loved last year. I don't know if you saw any of those videos I posted, but that was the most snow that Vegas has ever gotten. And it yeah. was absolutely spectacular. It was so cool. I was glad I didn't have to drive out in it because nobody uh, would have known what the <laughs> hell to do. Um, uh, I think I they called that. out every There's cop out there. There's people there that have trouble on dry pavement. You oh, put rain or snow on the, the ground, look out. I stayed home those yeah, days. <laughs> you're just screwed. Just if you have to, just don't leave. Just don't leave. Well, guys, let's dig in. I, I know that we could probably just small talk all day. Everyone's <laughs> like, can you guys get us some creepy stories? Or like, what, Vegas drivers in the snow isn't creepy that, enough for you guys? <laughs> yeah, that's some real scary shit right there. 
Um, so who wants to start? It's e- either one of you guys. Everybody well, loves. Well, uh, I've been talking creepy. my head off here at the beginning. I'll let Cisco start. Okay. Ladies first. Golly. I wonder if I could think of a ghost story. Um, <laughs> I, bet, I bet you know a couple. Thought, yeah, you may well, know some. Just, just a couple of days ago, and I thought, you know, for Halloween, I would love to tell. I told Steve, why don't we tell some of our all-time favorites, whether they're ours or not? Mm-hmm. And it got us to thinking. And I thought I'd like to share one. Uh, with the listeners that just absolutely threw me for a loop and for two reasons and it'll become at the end it'll make sense uh, if you wouldn't mind of one course. of my time favorites at this time tomorrow that'll change but right now i'm doing <laughs> this um actually it was by an actor now i don't know if the you know the younger people will remember but telly savalas was a cool dude and when I was a kid, he was playing Kojak, and he had the lollipop, and he was like, who loves you, baby? I mean, he was just an awesome guy, and he was a man's man. And what I mean by that is he was a tough street kid, grew up, and, you know, just became that tough guy, but so sweet and sincere and gentlemanlike, you know? And I just always liked him growing up, and you never heard anything like he was doing something cheesy behind, you know? So an honest guy. Well, I never heard his ghost story. And not too long ago, I was pulling up. I'm always trying to find um, different people to bring on, you know, on my podcast on, you know, or whatever. And, you know, you, you want to get somebody different. And sometimes on the older shows, you can find a, a psychic or a medium or somebody's had an experience that you, you can find, you know, via social media or something. And along comes Telly Savalas. And I'm watching this show called The Extraordinary out of um, Australia. Great show. Very much like an old sightings. Some It was done somewhere around in the late 70s, early 80s. And he's on there and he tells this ghost story. And he's a young man, I think probably around 18, and he's out on a date. Now, this would have been about 1959 for him. And he runs out of gas. Uh, he takes the girl home and he runs out of gas on the way to his home. And he stops in an all, you know, I guess it was a fast food restaurant or something that was still open. I think it was a White Castle. And he asked them, you know, is there a gas station around here open? They said, okay, we'll cut through the woods here. It was a wooded lot or something. He goes, go through there and you go up the highway and there's a gas station open. So he gets through the woods and he just gets on the highway and a Cadillac pulls up next to him. And it stops and he hears this really high voice. And the guy says, I'll give you a ride. Real creepy. You know, very high, very off, but still very just lilting and nice, really. He turns around. He says, he never heard the car pull up. You know, never saw this guy before. And the guy said, okay, great. You know, I ran out of gas, blah, blah, blah. He gets in the car. The guy takes him to the gas station. And he said they were just having little kind of little chit chat, small talk. And he's reaching around and he gets closer to the station. He's reaching around and he's trying to f- fumble in his pockets looking for money. He realizes he doesn't have any money. And without saying anything, the guy says to him, I'll loan you a dollar. Of course, back then you get a lot of gas for a dollar. Yeah. And uh, he hadn't said anything. And he said, well, I feel really bad about this. He says, I have a job. I just please give me your address. I want to send it back to you because that's what you did back then. You paid back. You know, and he pushed the guy. And when they got to the gas station, he made the guy write down his name and address so he could mail him the money. So he had that on the paper. He goes and he gets a gas can, gets a gas, gets back. Guy drives him back to his car and then pushes, helps him push the car to get it started. Back then, some cars, you had to do that. And that was it. The guy was gone. So the next day, he wants to return the money. He calls the number on the paper and he asked to speak to Mr. Cullen. And I believe the guy's name was Jimmy, Jimmy Cullen. And the guy who answered the phone says, hang on a minute. And the next thing, the lady gets on the phone. She says, I want to speak to Jimmy Cullen. She goes, look, you know, he's not here. And he goes, you know, he's not here. He said, well, what do you want him for? Um, He gave me a ride yesterday, loaned me some money. I'd like to return it. And she got mad and she cussed at him and she said, look, yes, obey. He's been dead for two years. That's my husband you're talking about. And I don't know what you're trying to pull here. Mm. 
So he, Telly Savalas is just shocked, right? And she hang, slams, hangs up the phone. And he's just, I, I don't know what to do with this, right? Because the number worked. She knew him. He's confused. So he said he didn't give up. He called a couple times. He tried to talk to her real nice and explain to her, ma'am, I'm not pulling anything here. She finally, after all his pushing, decides to meet him. They met halfway. Um, he was in New York. She was in Boston. They met halfway. That's a lot. But there was a lot going on. She wanted to know, and so did he. She brought a sample of his writing, a letter that he had wrote to her in the war back in 45. The writing matched exactly. And the only difference was he had signed Jimmy on hers and James on his. Mm -hmm. The only difference, the writing, the writing matched. And during the conversation, the clothes he was dressed in, which was a light colored suit, was the clothes that she had buried him in. Oh my God. He owned a cat. And then he said, but, you know, he had this very high kind of squeaky voice. And she said, oh, no, his voice was very low like yours. Mm. But he committed suicide and he shot himself in the throat. Mm. Now, you'd think that that was the end. But a few years later, he's playing golf on a golf course with a friend of his, two guys. And he said along about the sixth hole, he was in Florida on a, on a golf course. He hears this yell from off you know, one of the hills there, Telly, called him Telly. He recognized the voice. He turns around, it's this guy in the suit. He said, did you hear what happened in Dallas? And Telly goes, did you hear him? The guys heard him. The two guys he was with heard him. He said, did you hear what he said? He said, yes, I'm about Dallas. And then he said something else that Telly Savalas would not, would not divulge. Well, they finished their golf game. The guy disappeared. He said, well, what was that? You know, and then you tell he blew it off because he, oh, you know, trying to be <laughs> his big guys, you know. And then he goes back and they eat. You know, they go to the club and they order the food and look up on the TV. And Walter Cronkite comes on and talks about uh, JFK just got shot in Dallas. And he told them, the guy came on the hill and told them mm. an hour and 20 minutes before it happened. Now, that blew my mind. Isn't that something? That story gives me chills. <laughs> Man. How, I mean, there's no way for him to guess a phone number just no. to have it match up to. I mean, no, that's the first step. And then the second step is JFK yeah. an hour and a half before on the golf course. Right. In the middle yeah. of nowhere. Just before he said it just oh it, it had just happened. Yeah. You know, when. Because you know how quick they broke in and said the president has been shot. Yeah. You figured out minutes. So, and he said something else. Like maybe he divulged something about, you know, the actual shooter or some kind of, you know, whatever you want to get in conspiracy wise. But Telly Savalas did not divulge that to anybody mm. till the day he died. So it must have been something heavy. Yeah. And that's just the kind of man he, you know, he was and he proved to be. He didn't want to tell this story. You know, but he wanted to tell and, and give it out a little bit to let people know that these things happen, you know. And, um, you know, if you're skeptic, you're a skeptic. But he was going to tell it and he told it like it was. And the thing that it got me and gave me the chills because, and I picked that one for, is because after you got to figure 47 years of doing this, 47 years of looking into this and trying to gather data and stories and then writing a book and going through everything we went through just to get the book out. The whole reason behind that is I wanted to put my stories in there so people could have the same experience because I just had that a couple of days ago because that happened to me. His story pretty much happened to me. I got a ride from somebody like that. I didn't hear the car. I didn't see nobody else saw the car that I got out of, you know. And it came at a time when I needed it on the highway, you know, the way he said the guy looked at him in his eyes and the way he felt when he looked at him, the whole overwhelming feeling of calm and you're okay and oh. all of that, all of that stuff was exactly what happened to me. So it was almost like I was getting a gift just a couple of weeks ago. You know, you think you can't hear anything new in this and then bam, I got what I was trying to do for other people from a dead man from Telly Savalas. 
<laughs> so cool. Mm. You know, because it matched mine. Unbelievable. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? Love that story. Yeah, pretty cool. Thanks, Telly. Class yeah, Cisco had shared that with me. And there was another part to that. The, when he first got the ride from the guy, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the baseball player, the infielder, oh the utility God. infielder. Yeah, I forgot that part. Mm -hmm. Tell that. Tell that. Okay. Well, when he's riding with the guy, just they're about to get to the gas station, whatever. The guy just out of the blue says, I know so-and-so. And it was, Telly didn't know who it was. And mm -hmm. the guy's like, he plays for whatever sports team. And, and Telly wouldn't name the man or the team, but just that the guy was a utility infielder for this famous ball team. And so the guy just said that out of the blue and Telly's like, well, you know, I'm not a big baseball fan. It didn't, didn't mean anything to me. Well, after all this had happened, the first time he gets, you know, the gas and gets for his car and he's gone, and he's thinking, oh, this is weird. And he's got the guy's name and number. But then the next day, he's, uh, I think he was sitting in a bar and he hears on the TV that utility infielder for whatever team it was has died. And the guy was really young. He was like 26, 20, 26 27 years old, something like that. And he just died that morning. Oh, geez. So the guy mentioned the person, said, I know this guy just out of the blue and didn't say, you know, that something had happened to him or that something was going to happen to him, but just mentioned the name and tell he said, you know, just because it was such an odd thing there, you know, just some Jeez. random ball player, they hadn't been talking sports or anything. So yeah, this guy was on to something and was, he's driving a Cadillac and wearing a white suit mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Telly described all that to the wife. And she said, that's what I buried him in. Mm -hmm. And uh, the handwriting matched up, except he had written, yep. James Cullen, and he had all everything else. He had signed yeah. Jimmy. Yeah, oh, so, and then the voice maybe thing it was the with him. Around, but she said it was his handwriting on the card that yeah. Telly had. Yeah, he, he shot himself through and, the voice box. Yeah, <laughs> then that's why his his voice sounded higher. Voice. Oh my Such goodness! Such a creepy story. And then the the thing, you know, the ended it with Dallas there. Yeah. Over an hour before it broke on the news, before anybody knew. Mm-hmm. But see, back when that happened, that happened, of course, on the day of. And then Telly Savalas is telling it probably somewhere in the mid to early 70s. He's telling the story. Yeah. So at the time, it wasn't like it is now where people are speaking out on, you know, conspiracy fact or conspiracy right. theory. And you just didn't speak of things like that, you know, whether out of fear or danger or just being ridiculed so he kept that all to himself you know and there's another aspect to that i was thinking about it today um that the listeners might be interested in that also follows a pattern that i've been kind of paying attention to all of these years that it seems like if you go through something like that if you do something to harm yourself or take yourself out of this world it seems like you ha almost have to go through maybe not have to maybe it's a choice i think everything's a choice but it seems like you go through helping others maybe to mm. get your frequency back up mm -hmm. because i've seen a pattern of that i've had several of those things happen in my own life with you know and and uh, I don't think this guy was stuck. I don't think he was haunted. You know, I think he probably crossed over. And maybe there's something like, I don't know, like you, you got to do so many good deeds or help so many people. Or maybe if you can help somebody else that's in trouble or somebody else who's suffering, you know, or maybe, can, you know, thinking about committing suicide to change their mind. Maybe it helps you get through and move on. I don't know. But I see that a lot. You know, I mean, he was a suicide. You know, I had one in my my own family. I was standing <laughs> I was standing in a group of mediums, which, you know, it happens. And <laughs> there's me, there's mediums, there's psychics, there's a trance medium, there's a, you know, psychic medium. Everybody's just standing around a circle chit chat. And, you know, everybody's kind of off duty, you know. And then all of a sudden, this one comes up to my older son, and she says, I've been wanting to say this, like, all night, but do you know a young man? She describes him. And he's like, no, no. And I'm trying not to listen because it was private, but I'm hearing parts, you know. And she's like, no, no. And I'm watching his face. And all of a sudden, he just went completely, like, white. And 
I'm looking, and he's looking at me, and I'm looking back at him, and I'm like giving him the eye, like you need help, I can help you. <laughs> and he, and he's like holds up his hands, like I got it, but oh my god! And he brings me over, you know, waves me over, and she's telling him this, and she's describing this guy behind. He did know him. He committed suicide, and he was trying to help. He was he had been following my older son around for months, trying to help him in a situation that he was in mm. and to the point where he was moving stuff, trying to get his attention. He was doing this. He was doing that. And all the things that he thought he was going crazy were actually happening. And it was this guy. And he was trying to get his attention to get him out of a situation that he was in that was potentially very harmful. And that kid committed suicide. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, just, I've got a ton of stories like that. And I think there's something to do with that. You know, maybe if you go out and you didn't go out, you know, quite at the time you were supposed to yeah. or something along those lines. That's just amazing to me. Might be a little payment due on the back end there. Yeah, something. Or just to raise, I think it's more like a raise your vibration. Because if you go out on a lower vibration, not, we're not talking low, low, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to say go out on a lower vibration there might be some things that we can do um to raise that you know i think that's true here while we're still alive too but it's i think that's just an interesting concept you know i don't know what do you think steve yeah i i agree it's just you know depends on your take on it and what you put into it and what you take away from it but it's it's fascinating nonetheless yeah, I mean, if you can get, I mean, I know that there's, um, for, for, I know that there's an awful lot of ghosts who get stuck. If you just want to say that stuck, either whatever caused that, either confusion or aggravation or violence, uh, quickness of everything, you know, whatever it may be, because um, every individual is just an individual. Everybody handles things differently. You can have one plane crash. I know this. You know, I hate to say for a fact, but I know it for a fact. There's <laughs> there's a plane crash in a cornfield, and uh, this actually happened. And uh, there were seven people that were still there in that cornfield 20-something years later. Mm. And people are in there, and they're trying to communicate with them. Mm. And seven spirits are right there. Three of them had no idea they were dead. Nor were they aware of the other spirits that were there Mm. or the other ghosts that were there. There was one who knew he was gone, knew what happened, but didn't want to leave the other spirits because he was afraid if he left them, they'd be stuck. And I mean, this is 25 something years. I mean, each one had a different story. Same crash, same thing. Now, all the other people that died moved on. Mm. So and I say that. Because I don't want anybody to ever hear me talk about a story and think, okay, all suicides do this. All this does this. All these people, this happens to them. No, it's the individual. Nobody can say that any one group, all this exactly happens to them because it's the individual. And I think each individual takes, you know, the afterlife individually, the everything. I think there's probably some laws, some rules love to see that book but i think that's as individual as that person because i've seen you know everybody has it's listened to these stories Mm -hmm. when you have something like that and you've got seven different ghosts and some of them are even aware that they're standing right next to another one what does that even mean you know when you think you understand then it's hard to understand that but when you're standing Aaron, you're involved in it. That's incredible. Well, I mean, you you guys haven't received your copy of the handbook for the recently deceased yet. I mean, <laughs> and also so, sometimes I wonder if, I mean, is there really case managers on the other side? You know, kind of just helping you along. Yeah. And if you have unfinished business, here's how you may go about it. It does make Not one a- wonder. I don't think there is a caseworker or a handbook because you run into <laughs> that a lot. Where yeah. there's obviously some kind of unfinished business. And they don't know how to, to cope with it or how to deal yeah, with it. Yeah, they're just here for a long time, unfortunately. It. And although and I, they, for, they don't listen, 
I think sometimes they don't listen, Steve. Yeah. You know, well, and you get that they're all individuals, but I've found that it seems like certain types. And again, this is not necessarily a blanket statement, but people that were nasty in life tend to be just as nasty in death. I've never heard of anybody who was well loved and well liked that came back and just tortured people and, and, you know, wrecked the house and things unless they were really trying to get attention and then they would maybe do some things that were out of character for them. Yeah. But I think a lot of the malevolent spirits were just malevolent people in life and it just, it, it followed them on. You're probably an ass soul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The ass shall but, continue. <laughs> <laughs> but see that that's true. But you know, um, you also think to, Absolutely. I 100% agree. But I think it's, um, I don't think it's the, the, the type of the person that causes the stay. I think the person in themselves caused the stay, whether it's their own confusion, their anger, their fear, you know, um, but so many. I think if, if I had to make a chart and look, I'm nobody. I'm just somebody who's been studying this 47 years. I got more questions than anybody listening. But if I was forced to make a chart, I'd say the highest reason that I have personally heard for people staying is fear. I don't want to be judged. Mm. I, you know, I've seen hell. I don't want to, mm. you know, I don't want to, I don't, I've seen it here. I know what this is like. I'm not going over there. My my ex wife's over there. I don't want to see her. <laughs> He's like you that know, is that, hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Huh. But that, you know, it's an actual statement. I've yeah. actually heard one. Mm-hmm. You know, nah, I you know I did 40 years with her. I ain't going over there. You know. <laughs> and then like my biker in the story in our book to tell two bikers, the one that I had a hold of. He was scared because he didn't know what to expect. He'd been a not so nice person, and he was afraid of what was going to happen to him. He didn't want to cause his his mother any more pain because he'd already been, you know, a tough guy and a bad guy growing up, and just didn't know that she had already passed. And essentially, she had forgiven him for all that he had done. But that was what was holding him here. Uh-huh. And mm-hmm. that's that's a great story. And Cisco and. Uh, right. The other lady that helped out with that, they were the ones that took that over. I was just the conduit that gave them what they needed to find to get it taken care of. That was a tough, tough, I don't want to say case, but it was a tough case. It was It was all, it was so new. Like I said, anytime you think that you understand, you know, this whole subject will show you something like, can we get a load of this? Mm-hmm. And when he called me, I mean, that one took months months i mean people think that it's you think about any individual that's here and is having any kind of um uh, need for therapy whether it be you know past experiences or just having a hard time coping with things um and then you know take that same person and they're dead now you're just dealing with what what is willing to communicate with you and you're trying to put them through this this therapy of you know okay first let's calm down what are you thinking what's bothering you you don't want to talk about it you know, I mean, it's like <laughs> it's 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 therapy and this guy would not talk to women and he came to steve and steve didn't know what to do with him because he he couldn't get him it would be so easy shannon if if they had the ability to say look i'm dead um, I don't want to be here. Uh, I, I want my family to know what happened. I'm sorry for the things I did. I don't want to talk about them. But if I don't talk about them, I can't let them go. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? They're holding on to that. Yeah. It's holding them down. And then they go through all this. It would be so much easier if they would just speak that way. But most of them don't communicate that way. They either communicate through pictures or whatever the ability they have, and whatever ability mm-hmm. you have to understand what they have. It's difficult. And he would not talk to any of the women. I had four women working on this and all in different states, which is wild. None of them knew each other. None of them knew this guy. But it was the most beautiful story about all the people got together, took each of their individual talents and went in there and helped this gentleman go on the best ride of his life. Yeah. And it was kind of like I was the lightning rod that – 
I don't. I still don't know really if what I saw in the dreams is what had actually happened, or if that was just kind of something that was being put there to get my attention. But I was having these horrible reoccurring dreams, and it was a, this site like out in an abandoned area. The pavements cracked. There's weeds growing up. I can see abandoned factories and things on the other side of a river. And I, in the dream, I looked over the bank, and there's a motorcycle laying there, all mangled up and partially covered in dirt or about half covered in dirt that's been uh, sliding off the bank there. So I'm just like, huh, you know, that's probably stolen or, you know, I don't know why anybody leave it out here. A few steps farther, I find a corpse under a cedar tree and he's in a, yeah, an extended state of decay, I guess we'd say. Mm -hmm. And then every time I had this dream again and again and again, the motorcycle would be a little farther in the dirt. The corpse would have a little less, whatever was left of it still there. It was turned into just bones. And I think what it was at the time, the place I was working was a very, very toxic environment. That building had seen some suicides and things in the building previously when it was uh, some kind of banking institution type thing. And I was seeing things at work. So I was doing all this with Cisco's guys to protect myself. I was carrying crystals. I was smudging myself before I went to work, I was, you know, doing things there. And I think what that did, that amplified the light or whatever that was surrounding me to protect me. Mm-hmm. And I believe like a moth to the flame, this guy, wherever he was and whatever his deal was, he saw it and came to it and said, you know, here's this, mm-hmm. I could see this guy standing out. Yeah. I'm going to go talk to him. And my grandmother, the self-professed gypsy witch, she always told me if you have a dream Three times or more, you need to pay attention to it. There's, something's trying to tell you something or get in touch with you. Mm. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I was Cisco and I were looking at maps. We're pulling up Google Earth. I'm describing places and buildings and the way the river run and the direction that the sun was setting. And we're, we're looking for a body and a motorcycle. And the amazing part, this one psychic lady that Cisco went to, before Cisco had ever told her any of the story at all, not word one, the lady says, first of all, you need to quit looking for the motorcycle. Oh, my gosh. And, and talk what? about it. It's blown away. Yeah. She no. had no foreknowledge or anything of I'm it. I tough all my mediums and my psychics, man. I sat oh. in front of her. I said, hi, baby. How you doing? She said, so. she said, what are you here for, girl? And I said, I'm just going to sit here. I've been given permission to let you have somebody else's energy. And I know that sounds really weird, but I had to get Steve's permission. So she, I right. carried his energy put it on the table and go, you're reading his energy. And she says, I got two guys and I'm like poker face. I won't give you nothing. You're not getting nothing off of me, you know, and I'm poker and I'm, mm-hmm. you know, we're just going. And she says, okay. Oh, wow. And I'm just like, look at her smile. And she goes, you need to stop looking for the orange and white motorcycles. She says, nothing to do with the motorcycle. This is what's going on. And I'm <laughs> oh like, all yours, man. And Cisco, so like, like, that's the one. That's uh, the lady that we yeah. need to, to get rid of this. Yeah. Oh and it was God. how I wound up going to see her, too. But, yeah, you got to tell her what you said to me when you first called me. He, This man calls me up on the phone at 9 o'clock <laughs> at night. And <laughs> what do you say? Like Cisco. Like Cisco. I, I think I know a- where there's a body. <laughs> Well, I'm like, I, that's how you open it up. I love something it. about that. She's like, "What have you done?" She's like, "I need to get a shovel." <laughs> that's <laughs> a true friend. No, it's not. Do yeah, we need the tarp like, and the shovel? <laughs> that's exactly what I said to him. I said, "I got two sexes. It's concrete, the <laughs> shovel, but not." But that, yeah. I see. You know what? That brings up something else. If you think about it, how many times? And I know people like this. You know, I, people that are wiser than I'll ever be and have much better gifts or talents or abilities than I'll ever have that are constantly confounded with this. They're given things and they're given stuff to like, here, this is going to happen. And then, or this did happen and you can't just pick up the phone. You can't pick up 911 and go, look, there's a ghost sitting on my couch. She (laughs) says she's, you know, buried here. Can you go look? What do you do with this information? (laughs) Right. You know, I mean, I've got a story that will knock your socks off that happened to somebody. I won't tell you who it was. I mean, I'll keep her privacy. But this woman was tormented. And I mean tormented. You're just talking about a mom, you know, trying to get her kids to school. You know what I mean? You get the kids out to school and, you know, all of a sudden you look at the breakfast table and there's this dead girl sitting there. Mm. And she has the ability to see. 
you know, I see dead people. I mean, she's, you know, right there, boom, in their death state, which is not a pretty thing for anybody to have to deal with. Have you ever seen The Sixth Sense? That's what I'm talking about. They show up in their death state to this woman. And she's, oh, you know, and it's, you don't, it's not like you get used to it. And, um, right, you know, at first it starts slow, you know, so there's a couple times she's popping up. She's going to pick up the kids at school, poor girls in the back seat. She's trying to talk to her, like, look, you can't keep doing this. You know, <laughs> this is bad, you know. Finally, they keep talking. She says, you have to talk to me. You're here for a reason. You must talk to me because we got to get this over with. You can't keep doing this. This poor woman went through this for two months until, for whatever reason, the ghost, who was a ghost because she had not crossed over. That's just what I mean. She says she finally gets the ability to start speaking and getting her mind together enough to speak to this woman. And again, like Steve said, she's drawn to her light and her ability. Well, long story short, she finds out that this girl was murdered. Horribly, horribly murdered. This woman was picked up in a um, car wash. One of those car washes that you can go by yourself and you put the dimes in, quarters in. Mm -hmm. right and they came on both sides, cornered her, took her, picked her up, threw her in the back of a car. And rode around the highways and raped her mm. and took turns. And then one of the guys decided they were going to get rid of her, stabbed her. They caught her up and threw her pieces out oh. into, into the woods as they went. This is a horrible, unthinkable thing to happen to a human being. Yeah. Or for human beings to do to one another. Plain and simple. The reason the ghost was compelled. You would think, okay, I want vengeance for my death. No, no, she did not. She was gone and she was okay. You know, I mean, it happened. Mm -hmm. I'm not here for vengeance. Mm -hmm. I'm here because he's going to do it again. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that one, she had it together enough to find a way to do something about it. And two, she knew where that murderer was, at least one of them. Mm -hmm. And she knew he was going to do it again. And he was in jail and he was fixing to get out in a week. So, my friend who's a psychic, she has to go down to the place. She does some research. She goes to the police officer um, that was on the case. And unfortunately, the one that started it was no longer there. And this guy had the cold cases. She convinces this guy, you've got to look here. Okay, they look there. They find parts of the body. Now she's locked up. She's locked up. She's in there for nine hours and almost overnight because she's got information. And you can't really blame the police. Right. That's where body, bodies bury. She finally convinces the guy, look, you know, and I, she told him a couple things about himself that she couldn't have known and got his trust a little bit and said, look, if she says it, if you look, it's in the evidence. If you go in the evidence and you look, there is a pack of cigarettes. It was an old Marlboro pack, the old box. There's a cigarette in there that he smoked half of and put back in. Check the DNA. Because back then they didn't have the DNA. They checked it. It was him. And he got pinned for the murder. A ghost that solved the murder. Mm -hmm. She never saw it again after that. And he didn't get to get out and do it again. That's incredible. I have is a question cool? for you. And, and it is. It's, it's, all, it's an incredible story, but I think... People that that rape and murder and things it's there's just nothing more disgusting than that uh what happens to people that do these kinds of things uh they kill children they rape children they torture they murder it's something that is it's an almost um it's mostly incomprehensible to most of us quote unquote normal people if you can call us normal but this compulsion is so strong that these people cannot stop it. They say they're just mentally ill or whatever the, the reason is. But is there, in fact, a hell that these kind of sure. people go to? Where where do these people go when they go? If you want, if you're asking me, I just have to give you a theorized opinion based on, let's just say, like a hypothesis and a lot of studying. I would say that, yes, it is um, a hell basically, but I think it's their own. I honestly, and again, this is only my opinion. 
I honestly believe that you have to go through all the pain that you caused. Mm. So if you cause that pain, you have to feel that yourself. So that means every time you made somebody cry, every time you gave somebody whatever, whether it was on purpose or not. Um, do I think, you know, do I think there's some kind of fiery pit? Maybe if that's what you're belief is and that's what you think is going to happen i don't know because i've heard a lot of um ndes they're not all the white light tunnel yeah i've known a lot of people that died well not a lot of people that died but i know enough that have had the ndes that weren't so good that when they came back from it they changed their whole lives over mm. because if you think about it in layers that young girl that beautiful young girl that got killed and went through that torment in hell she didn't come back because she was angry at the guy and wanted vengeance on the guy. She didn't come back angry. She didn't come back, I want revenge. She had the wherewithal type of person she was. I don't know what kind of person she was, but she, as a ghost, she had the wherewithal to not have that anger and that, and she was had every right to be. She just didn't want him to get out and do it again. I, Lows in my mind. I think she would have been confused and erratic. I don't think she would. I think she would have been caught up in that frequency. I think she would have been a whole different kind of ghost. I think it would have been a whole different kind of experience. Not to say that she wasn't, it wasn't, wouldn't have been right for her to be that way. But because she had a calmness about her and a methodical presence, I think there was... Do you, do you get what I'm coming from? Because if I've seen the erratic, I've seen the, that, you know, they killed me, they, they, you know, and again, yeah. same type of horrible stuff, but they're erratic and they're all over the place and they're trying to put the pieces together and they're, they don't understand, you know, where's my body, what's going on. And it's a whole different kind of frequency that you're dealing with. Whereas this one was just so together. Well, and she was trying know. to prevent it from happening again, which, I mean, and then she was gone, you know, um, I, I just, I do, I think that there's something that we go through and to the point of, I'm a hugger and, you know, I like, I'll try to grab every time I can, I grab my kids or whatever and hug them, you know, whatever, because I said, well, I'm not just hugging you, I'm hugging me. Because if that's right. true and we go through the bad stuff, then I'm going to get the hugs later too and I'm probably going to need them. So if I'm wrong, <laughs> you know, I'm getting a lot of hugs and, you know, I don't know. What, what do you think? See, what, think do you, what do you think about that? Well, the way I look at it, I think you do have to answer in some way for what you've done, particularly something hurtful or something violent to anyone, but especially toward the innocent or children and yeah. something like that. And it could be, you know, a hell of your own creation or the Christian version of hell with the fiery pits and stuff. But I think there is something there. There's some kind of payment or retribution, a judgment that you go through. Yeah. And beyond that, I mean, who's to say? But I would rather err on the side of a caution and assume that there is something like that in the afterlife and seek to avoid it than to assume that there's not and then have a very unpleasant surprise when I get there. There you go. So that's, yeah. that's just, that's my take on it. Yeah. But you think too, when you're telling these, if you are able to communicate with someone who's stuck and you're trying to help a ghost, you also have to let them know that, you know, like say talking to the ghost, the Gettysburg on a battlefield, you're talking to soldiers, killed a lot of people. It's no different than talking to a soldier who's alive now that's going through things that they did. Yeah. You were a soldier. You did what you had to do. Um, I love you, man. You know, I mean, I've had those talks multiple times. And it's the same as talking to a ghost that's here and worried about the things they did. You know, it's a different it's a different kind of thing when you have some uh, a, a human being that's so broken inside for whatever reason, mentally physically they just came in broken who knows that has to do those kind of things to people you, your psyche is messed up to begin with your energy is screwed up so when you go you know i don't know that there's a, a place that you can go to heal i don't know if you go back in and you have to suffer and you do everything else and then you're recycled around again because to me what sense would that make you're just sending broken parts around and around and around and around 
you know, there's got to be something that either fixes what's broken or says this is broken and it goes into a heap somewhere and never to be used again. And then we're talking about a soul. So I don't know. That's a good question. I have a really random question, but I think this is a really good place to ask it. Uh, and again, very random. But especially someone like you, Cisco, who is very in tune with things, you've you've gone through a lot, you've seen a lot, you've heard a lot. Uh, it is very close to the I see dead people situation with you. You're very sensitive to things. Have you ever or do you think it's even possible if someone is a, of a darker soul and they are in quote unquote, and I, I kind of agree with you, it would make more sense if someone was that dark and demented, they would go through kind of their own hell. Have you ever heard of anybody conversing with someone like that or try, or those people are even able to break through and talk to anyone that is living and say, either it's for their own good, like, look what I'm going through, or um, yes. someone help me, or anything like that? Yes. Really? Yes. Mm-hmm. It's, I've, I've actually, um, I'm going to say three or four, that you have to change your ways, I'm going through hell. That was the actual word. You mm -hmm. have to change your ways, I am going through hell. The suffering is horrible. And basically that person in their own way, let this person know you have got to change. You do not want to go through what I'm going through. And that was years after they passed. This is the one particular one I'm talking about. Um, because and they had in fact done horrible things while they were alive? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And was very good friends with the person they came back to help. Right. Which is what I was saying in the beginning. Not that anybody who ever committed suicide is bad. I'm not saying that or accidentally overdosed or accidentally did, you know, whatever their own right. deeds no, no. were. And, but I've seen multiple of those come back and help mm -hmm. someone who was in like trouble, may have known them, may have not. And then I have seen exactly what you're talking about, where someone was very dark and, you know, selfish and did bad deeds from whatever variety you want to talk about. And after years after being dead, came back to help people and family mm. members and say, you've got to stop doing what you're doing because you do not, you will, you will have to pay for this. And that's basically what I base, you know, your theories on. And that's what they are. They all are all theories right. based on the data, you know, that you've collected. I mean, have I you ever they, heard of any, uh, you know, any details of what? that person or oh yeah what was Earth. going through what what Earth. did they classify as hell they basically the they had to suffer they had to go through all the pain they caused uh, okay so like if you cause but see keep in mind shannon we're not just saying you know i shot somebody right so i have to go through that pain of that bullet wound and what that person went through I have to go through the pain I caused his mother who right. cried for yeah. years. I have to go through the pain his wife did, his children growing up without a father. I have to that life touches so many other lives. Mm -hmm. And it's all of that. I know a gentleman who said, um, actually this man died had an NDEs more than once. And he's not a good friend, but I, I'm familiar with him. He said the worst thing that he went through uh, the, the second time, because the first time wasn't enough for him because he was, he was just this real tough old Marine kind of guy. You know, he'd been through wars. He'd seen hell, you know, human hell. And, um, it, it, he wasn't, he wasn't buying it. You know what I mean? He was like, eh, mm -hmm. you know, the second time he died, he went a little further, stayed a little longer. And, he had to go through all the suffering he had caused, including the people that he shot in war. Mm. Um, everything else he had to go through, seeing the wives, the, 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 you know, just like I just described. He said the worst thing he went through and he wished that he had never done was he, he was on his way to a party and he was, you know, drinking and smoking and coking it up. And it was all about him. And he hit a dog on a, on a dark road one night. And he knew he hit it. Mm. 
mm-hmm. and the dog hit and rolled and landed on the side and he could have stopped to go see if he could help that dog. And he didn't. He went on. He made a conscious choice. He moved on. And the suffering that that dog went through mm-hmm. and the loneliness that it felt. He said that was the worst thing he had ever felt. And it changed him. And now he lives his life for everybody else and puts everybody else first. Mm-hmm. So that means something. You see what I mean? If you think about it, if you have to go through everything that, oh, God, you know, be cool. Be nice to each other. That's all I can say. You know, mm. that's some. That's really something. And, yes, I have seen people come back. Have you, Steve? Um. In certain instances, I've not personally seen it, but I know of it, and I know people that it's happened to. And it, it's it's usually either as a warning to you know get your act together, or as a you know get your stuff packed. You're about to cross over yourself. I've told a story about how my mother, and she just it's been uh, about 15 years now since she passed away. Well, just the other day was the, the anniversary of that October 22nd. Well, a year before she died, she was getting out of the shower. She was at home alone and she saw her mother appear in the doorway when she'd opened the, the bathroom door to let the steam out. And, uh, my, her mother had somebody with her, but she could only see the hem of their skirt. And she, she called out to her and said it was just like without moving her feet or making a walking motion or anything, she just started going backwards into kind of a mist and vanished down the hallway. And it was a year to the day that my mother died. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what it was. I just, um, it was my mom was all upset. She was, you know, raised in a family where everything was an, an omen or a portent or a serious warning. And uh, my dad, my brother, and I tried to talk her. Oh, you know, it was just maybe she was come tell you good times are ahead. And she's like, no, 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 no. And then the following year, when my dad dropped dead of a heart attack in September, two days before his 82nd birthday, I thought, well, there you go. That's why Granny showed up to let us know about that. Mm-hmm. But then 32 days after that, my mom died. So I maybe she it was, it was to tell about both of them. But uh, if I ever see my grandmother, I'm going to let you know. I probably got a year left. Oh, so. <laughs> oh gosh. So don't you say it's that. Something. But I always it's love just... that you shared that, Steve, because, you know, that could be one of those things that is just so hard to talk about that you wouldn't share with anyone. And, and you always have. And I've always appreciated that. Yeah, I, I think I told that one last year, too. Yeah. So I apologize to the no, the no, it's, for doing that, a repeat, but that's maybe a, people didn't hear it last year. I'm sorry that I'm re- no, doing reruns here. Don't no, apologize. But that, that just had such an impact on me. And, of course, after they were gone, I lived in that house for another year or so. And I was always like, you know, I didn't like going to the bathroom and looking, having to look down that hallway yeah. towards the bedroom. Because I was you know, if I see my granny, I'm going to jump out of my skin. I mean, as much, <laughs> no one much can as blame I you. loved her and stuff in life. <laughs> I don't want to run into her in death. It's like no. I said, I'm going to think that as, you know, well, <laughs> there are 364 days left. Now, that may not be the case at all. I don't know. As far as I know, she never appeared to any of the other family uh, prior to their death, but she well could have, and they never mentioned it. Right. right. I mean, my mom, she told uh, my dad, my brother, and I, but she didn't mention it to any of her brothers. So. Mm-hmm. I mean, there might have been one that she talked to about it, but he was, he didn't care anyway. He was kind of a, nah, he did one of those people that don't believe in anything. Right. And that Somebody to me is just amazing. We were talking hard. about that the other day, oh. Cisco and I, how there are people that will live in a house that's active. I mean, very active where you can't ignore it. It's not the house settling. It's not a bird in the attic or mice in the walls or something. You know, you know there's stuff going on. And they just sit there and they're reading their paper, smoking their pipe or whatever, and they just turn a blind eye to it. Yep. And I don't know how that's, I mean, people say, you know, how do you see these things? How do you experience these things? How do you not in a situation like that? And just pretend like, oh, well, that's just my imagination. Nothing happened yeah. when it goes on and Every on and single on night, continues. it's just my yeah. imagination. Uh <laughs> Right. I'm that, a, that just, I that, that there are people like that, though. I, I absolutely believe that. And I honestly believe that there, there, there are houses that aren't haunted. I believe people are. Yeah. And um, what if that is a spirit come to warn them? 
trying to help them or something, and they're just, oh, well, that's, you know, the house settling, that's a bird in the attic, that's the pipes, you know, all the things that skeptics tend to trot out. What if it's not? Listen to it. Pay attention to it. I mean, it's not going to cost you anything necessarily, but if you do experience those things, take a little time and a little effort and see if it is a, certainly a message for you or if it's just, even if it is a spirit, it might just be a, a poltergeist or something acting up and being a little mischievous. I mean, you guys are both much more sensitive than I am, and I'm okay saying that. Do you guys have to shut this stuff off? I mean, maybe especially for you, Cisco, we all know how sensitive you are to this stuff. I mean, do you sometimes. get something every day? No. but Well, it depends on what something is. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, something for there. me, exactly, it's, is, is relative, much different than you. It's there Listen, constantly. Part time going down the highway. You heard the story I just told you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now those those guys were doing that to that woman on a, in a moving car on the highway, yeah. and I can tell you that cars go by me that just I mean it almost knocks me off the road sometime, and I'm like something's really? going on. That person's just left doing something. They're going to do something. There's there's and it's and it's not you know he's had a bad day or he's angry. It's a lot more than that. It's, bad and the same thing can oh, happen God. you know you're going through a neighborhood and you see all these nice neighborhoods well behind every door there's a story mm -hmm. you know and you can feel that and yes as i've gotten older i mean there's certain places i cannot go i will not go to the mall i will not go if i do i go i have to go right directly to the closest door i can to where i have to get my stuff and get out quick because um the it's it's funny in a mall Everything is high anxiety. It's um, a lot of um, merchandising, advertising, obviously. It's got to have it, can't afford it, must have it, uh, in debt. Um, a lot of people in there are trying to fill, not everybody, but there are a lot trying to fill like voids. So they're troubled anyway, maybe not even realizing. Mm -hmm. It's hard to explain, but it's so much. But then I could go in a coliseum where everybody's getting together to go see a concert, you know, and it's a different feeling. It's the people, it's the energy, it's, mm -hmm. it's what they're doing when they're there. I mean, hospitals, same type of thing. However, <clears throat> there's a lot of hope in a yeah. hospital too, as well as grief and pain. But I think there's a lot of hope too. And that is how it tends to balance it out some. Yeah. What I mean. And it's knowing how to prepare yourself for where you're going into. <laughs> Uh, before I really learned what I was capable of and stuff, I went to visit a friend whose child was in Children's Hospital in Knoxville, Tennessee. And that was the most evil place at that time that I had ever been in. Just there was a negative energy there, too, like a almost like an elemental type thing that was feeding off all that pain and suffering of those children. And it made me physically ill to just be in the presence of of whatever it was. And I had that happen other places, but yeah, it's, you learn to tune it out. You have to have to learn how to protect yourself. You've got walls and barriers put up and it's not always the dead. I've been haunted by the living. I can go into a nursing home and people do it unknowingly, but everybody in there will try to pull energy off me. Help me, help me. You know, mm -hmm. you got to get me out of here. I'm trapped in this body. I don't have my mind left. I don't know who I am or where I'm at. Help me, help me, help me. Because there's something about the human condition, the human psyche, and I think this is something that we've had for centuries, and it's just kind of been technologied out of us, if you will. But there is like a hive mind. There's a connection. There's. Mm -hmm. It's like I was talking on my show the other day how – you have intuition, you have, you know, a sense of deja vu or precognition, precognitive dreams and things. I've had that happen. I've, when the phone rang, I knew it was somebody calling to say somebody had died, and it was. That's happened on more than one occasion. But I think at one time, everybody had that ability, and just through telecommunications and the world growing smaller, we don't need it, so we don't use it, and, you know, you use it, use it or lose it, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, it's you said you learn where you can go and where you can't. And just even before I knew what it was, there would be certain places just riding in the car with my parents and I would feel a chill or feel something strange. And one time I found out about this place 
that I'd always felt that way. It turned out a kid had been run over and killed there with a car chasing a ball out in the road. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the things that my grandmother scared me to death with. I didn't say a word about it, never mentioned it to anybody. And I was thinking about it that night. We drove by the spot, and I felt it. I felt the kid's spirit there, drove on through. We get to her house. She took me in her sewing room, which she liked to do. She liked to get me alone and tell me all these weird things. And she wasn't trying to scare me, but she did a very good job of it. And she said, you you feel things, don't you? And I'm like, uh, yeah, Grandma, like what? And she said, like that spot on the highway tonight. And I just, mm. yeah, I'm like eight years old. My eyes, boom, wide as saucers, my mouth. Are hung. I didn't say a word to my parents. I certainly didn't say anything to her. But she knew what I'd felt when I was miles away and on the way to come see her. Mm. No, and that just. <laughs> you know that's and she that's what why she would do things like that. She was trying to help me come to grips with what I had, and we talked about things like the the precognitions and things. How there are some things you can't change, even if you know in advance, you know exactly when, where, what. Sometimes you just have to let things happen the way they're supposed to happen. There's some things you can fix and some things you can can't you know, that you can't. One of the things because, is there's people's journey and they have to go through it. Yeah. I mean, I cannot tell you how hard it's been to know something was coming. And then, I mean, to the point of, I mean, I've gotten to the point now where I can say, okay, who do I talk to about this? Mm-hmm. And I mean, I've literally run my finger down my phone contact mm-hmm. list. Just close my eyes. And I get this weird feeling, and then, you know, it's over this name, and I'm like, why them? Yeah. Really? Or you think about somebody, and then the phone rings, Yeah, it's them. Or you're thinking about somebody, and you call them, and they say, I was just thinking about you, too. And and then the other thing we were talking about, even if you could prevent something, it Mm -hmm. makes me wonder, these stories you hear about somebody that'll, you know, survive some horrible, horrible thing only a couple of days later to maybe die in a plane crash or something. Right. And it just makes you think, you know, well, if it's your time to go, it's your time to go. You might be able to push it out just a little bit farther. But uh-huh. that's that's why she taught me those things. There's some things that you just can't change, some you can. Because I'd ask her, why do I know things if I can't do anything about it? And I've talked to Cisco about that. I've struggled with these dreams that I've had where, you know, like, I knew my cousin had died, but, but, well, actually, he had already perished in a house fire. I just didn't know it yet. He had been dead for days, and they hadn't found the bodies yet. Oh, and I was like, you know, and just that I agonized over that. You know, I'm not a therapy-type person, but that would have been something that would have sent me to therapy. Yeah. You know, why do I know these things? Why do I feel these things if I'm powerless to stop it? And Do you guys find that as you get older, like each year, do you find that your your skills and these sensitive gifts get they get stronger? They you get more sensitive, or do they dull at all? Uh, speaking for myself personally, if anything's stronger, but it just it kind of stays the same, and I think I may be more in tune with it and know more how to handle it and how to deal with it. Mm-hmm. How's it work for you, Cisco? I think it's both. I think it does. I think it's just like doing setups. The more you use it, the more you get open to it. Like Mm -hmm. that's why I believe that when you're working in that place, it opened you up because you were more in tune with it. And that's why who that one guy saw your light or however you put it, like turning on a porch and the bugs come to it. Um, I believe it gets stronger. The more you use it, the more you practice it. Cisco warned me to get out of that place. And I was seeing things I would see. Mm -hmm. I'd be the last one out of the building some nights and I would see just down the hallway, I'd around the corner and see somebody just entering the men's room. I'd see like the the leg, you know, with the, the leather shoe on, the nice business slacks and stuff. See them disappear, disappear in the restroom. I'd go in there and there's nobody in there. There's one door in or out. There's oh, no, absolutely oh, nowhere to go. I had that happen on several occasions. And then later I found out a person had hung themselves in that restroom <sighs> in the back stall. Mm-hmm. And there was all kinds of things going on I there. Mean, People were getting worse. sick. There was about yeah. one person a week that they were taken out there in an ambulance. It mm-hmm. was just that toxic environment. There had just mm-hmm. been so much that had happened there and that had gone on. It wasn't just that one guy. And that how long were you there, Steve? Uh, probably a good part of a year. 
Yeah. And I mean, I'm taking crystals with me to work. I'm smudging like, you know, she's telling me to and stuff. And I think that's all that, I mean, I was having health issues and, um, mm-hmm. The lady that was in the group that I was in, she went in the ladies' room the other day, which was on the other side and farther down the hallway, and had some kind of total meltdown. They took her out, like, tied to a stretcher. And and when she did come back, she's like, I don't know. She's like, I went in there. I wasn't myself. Mm. And I just, she's like, it was, I lost my mind. So there was something in that place. I don't know if it was on an ancient burial ground or a cemetery. But even before that, like I said, prior to this company being there, the other company that had been there, people killed themselves and got sick and just, it was something all the time. So I got out of there. Besides it the suicide, I mean, did, did you ever find or look into anything else that was going on at that property or the land, I, like you mentioned? I had talked to some people that had worked there before I did that knew of the suicide and things. And I, I won't talk a lot about that just for privacy of the family, but I did verify what had happened there. And, uh, even the people that had worked there before talked about, there was a heaviness, there was something there mm. and, you know, you're at work and it's high stress and high anxiety. And you think, well, yeah, of course it's evil. It's work, but there was, it went beyond that. And it just, it got under a lot of people's skin. And I think it contributed to the man's yeah. suicide. I mean, he'd lost his job too, but a lot of that was due to not being able to perform to the best of his abilities, probably. I mean, I'm theorizing here because of all the Whatever stuff that was going before. on in the building yeah. and the next energy there. Call me. I was walking across the floor. I remember it like it was yesterday and it was years ago. It was about four o'clock my time and something, I hit something. And I don't know how to explain it other than that. It's almost like walking into an invisible wall. And all of a sudden, Steve's face came up into my mind's eye. And I saw him circling a drain, a dark, nasty drain. Just like you would imagine, you know, water circling in a, going down a big hole. And I called him. And I, that's when I stopped playing around. I said, Steve, I don't know what you're doing. And she said but that, she said, but you're that circling place. the drain, and she's like, get the circling F the out of there. You've got to stop, <laughs> drop, and roll, man. I'm not kidding. There's nothing I, you can fight I had this. stayed out stop. that day, and she said, don't go back. Don't even go back for your personal stuff. And I had something there that was kind of precious to me, and she named it. She told me what it was. She what? said, for, forget the crystal. You don't need the crystal. Oh my and gosh. she said, and that damn carving – Leave it there. And it was. It was a little carving. And there's no way she could have known that. No. no, Right? That's exactly how it came to me. This is the God's honest truth. I mean, I was talking to him. I said, Steve, I don't know where you are right now. He said, I'm home. I said, good. I said, you're thinking about going back there. And then you're going (laughs) back. I'll tell you what you're going back for. I said, you're not just going to clean out your desk. There's something small and brown. It's a carving. And I said, if you take that with you, it's going to be in it. Because it knows you're coming back for it. Do not go back, leave everything, and don't ever go back. And he didn't. Oh, what a badass. What, you, you're both what, badasses. You realize this, right? I would have went back and, try, and got it and tried to cleanse it. Not when Cisco I'm tells you no, you know. Yeah, <laughs> get that kind of warning and her knowing exactly what it was. Oh, and my God. Said it meant a lot to me. The, a very, very, very special person gave it to me. Yeah. But, you know, I, I let it stay with the building. I don't know oh. what they did. They threw it in the garbage or <laughs> Somebody Dude. took it home or something, but it wasn't me. God, God help them. Have you guys because met before? Have you two ever point. been in the same space in person? No. Well, not in person. <laughs> I, I wonder yeah. what that would be like. I mean, what if you two went to Gettysburg or one of these other uh, places? That's I mean, what something would we've had planned. It hadn't come to fruition yet, but... <laughs> Carry us out I, of there. I think it'll be an interesting situation. Uh, to yeah. Together. If, if we call you for bail <laughs> money, I hope <laughs> I will be there in a heartbeat. <laughs> I'm going. I'm going back again. I got invited. We'll to go get back. kicked out of somewhere. We'll be in there trying to free spirits. <laughs> well, or it would only be look, right to, to get kicked out. It's getting ridiculous, Sharon, Shannon, because this is it. This is what happened. This is actually what I said. These gentlemen invited me back. They said, Cisco, please, you know, we got no. we got the room for you. You know, you and your son, whatever you want to do, come back. No cost. You know, we got you covered. Mm-hmm. We need you to come back, you know, help us with this situation. And I said, okay, but you have to tell the homeowners that if I come there, I'm not leaving till I cross that spirit. 
That's what I'm coming there for. If I'm getting in the car and I'm driving out there, it's not going to be one of those situations where they go, we just want you to talk to her and we want to keep her as a pet. <laughs> yeah. It's our pet. Okay, when you pets. take your bedroll and you give them a shopping list. This is what I like for dinner. And I like my dinner at this time and yeah. uh, black that, coffee in the mornings, please. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know mediums that that's happened to. It. Steve told me that this one these these one people invited a um, a good really good medium in there, and they said if you cross the spirits, we'll sue them. We'll sue you. And I'm like, <laughs> what? Oh, I would have done to go wind up in court that day i want to sit in front of a judge and go yeah, yeah. totally worth it they <laughs> had kind of a, a dead and breakfast thing going on so they wanted the medium to come in oh and God. just verify oh yes there's a spirit here and it's this and and she was going to go in and send it on its way and she's like no don't do that this is our livelihood you know we're oh my uh, the bed and breakfast but with ghosts so it's a dead and breakfast and it's like, not up to living you there it's our not ghost a, will sue you spirit <laughs> you know it's like them. I had to leave that one at the bar. I don't know if I ever told you that story, but God bless them. We went back there four times. Like I said, I have more abilities than I'll ever have. And that gentleman, he did not want to leave. And I said, you know, listen to me. You have to understand you might like it like it is now, but it could take another 100, 150 years, maybe never for somebody else to come back in here that can hear you, that can speak to you, right. that help you. And this, this place might be a parking lot. You know, because this guy actually made himself a box like he could not leave that property. So now why I'm like, sorry to interrupt you, but why he made himself a box because he was so tied to the place he didn't want to leave or how does that happen? He had caused his own um, I don't know how to put it like uh, his own his own psyche felt like he had to stay in that okay. in that estate. And it had been a bar when he liked to go there, and it was still a bar. It wasn't the same bar, but it was, uh, you know, a bar still. And he liked to hang out with the atmosphere and, you know, that whole thing. He had done some things in his life he didn't want to face. And he was just, he was going to stay there. And I said, okay, we will walk out of here, but it may take, you know, time is different to you. You know, 500 years might be nothing. Right. If we might ever never see it. You have to understand that it's each different. You know, I've seen ghosts that thought that their house was exactly like it looked when they were there. That's why sometimes they'll walk through walls that used to be a door and it's not a door anymore. It's not even the same house or it's not, you know, one of the famous stories was that uh, Ghosts R Us, Toys R Us uh, thing with Yanni. Yeah. I don't know if anybody's ever heard that. That's an old one. But yeah, That was in uh, somewhere in Southern California. That was an amazing story. But Oh, you guys can't tease it and not tell it now. <laughs> All right. Uh, the, the the story is that he was basically, his name was Yanni. He was a Swedish uh, immigrant. This is going way back. This was back when, you know, the pioneers were still busting, you know, to get out of California and stuff. And he was um, a little slow. And he was a farmhand. And the uh, his boss who owned the place, you know, the plantation owner or whatever, um, had a young daughter. Now he talked to her every day. Uh, it was one of those times, you know, it was way back, way back. And he loved her from afar. And he would write her little notes the best he could because he wasn't really good at spelling and stuff. And just trying to profess his, you know, love. And she blew it off, blew it off. And then finally she got upset because the, the more he, she started hanging with this one guy and he, uh, she was going to get married he started to panic and he's saying you, but you don't know me you don't know how much I love you you don't know what kind of a man I could be you don't love me because of this you know because I'm a farmer whatever mm -hmm. and you're a rich girl well she really blew him off in a nasty way and he was so angry he was trying to get over his anger and he was chopping wood and he was doing it a little crazy and he slipped and he cut his leg and the poor guy was by himself he went to his little shack and uh basically just mourned you know losing her and didn't take care of the leg didn't get help it got gangrene he died now this guy saw his shack he saw the field he worked in he saw everything else and it became a toys r us and he didn't see the Toys R Us. He saw his field. He saw the lake. He saw everything just like it was. 
And he used to go around the Toys R Us. And of course, when he went by, he wasn't doing it. But when he went by, his energy would make certain toys go off. And you can imagine what kind of thing it was. Um, Water would turn on. He was trying to get some attention. Some things he did with his energy and some things his energy caused. And then they had to keep bringing mediums in there to try to explain to him, you've got to go. And he, you know, there was no... They didn't have a whole lot to work with with him because there was no loved one on the other side to right. send him to. He didn't have anybody. And he decided to stay there. And now it's probably a parking lot. Aww. But he sees his stuff, but he's still suffering. Right. Isn't that terrible? Damn, that's sad. I know. Uh, I'm going to send you a link, Shannon, that you can put in the show notes. I would. It has that. more of the story. Yeah. And he actually, Jeez. while they were doing an investigation, and this is back in the 70s, he manifested in a photograph. And yeah. you can see the guy. He's very long-legged, very tall. He looks oh. like, you know, just a hick farmer. Mm-hmm. Somewhere, but it's just, it's amazing. In that case, you would have had to probably oh. work with some of the animals took care of. Because that's what that one guy in uh, Gettysburg, uh, he had nobody who was an orphan. And I had to connect him to a dog he had that had passed. I said, that was love. You know, that dog is waiting for you. Let's connect with that. And got him thinking. And but, I mean, that's, it's so hard. I think, I honestly believe with my whole heart that love is the strongest energy there ever is or ever could be. And I don't think it ever dies. And I think it, I, I really think it can rise above anything. And if you can get them connected into that feeling, but. You know, if you've got somebody like that, that just or or a soldier that's been fighting for years and living in mud and killing and, you know, lost everybody or never had anybody. It's so hard to get them to connect to that high vibration like that. If you think about it, man, that you was, know, that was a, that was a sad story, guys. Goodness me. And I'm, I'm glad you told it. But. Holy crap. But see, he was one that saw the area around him yeah. like it was. So, yeah. That was his, that's, that's what he manifested in his mind. It never changed for him. And the places and, that he would walk, and he was like walking by a well or a part of the gate for the goats or whatever the hell it was. And, and meanwhile, he's walking by a, a, a Lego section and Legos are flying off of a shelf at a Toys R Us. And then there's some that are completely the opposite. That's why they say when you when you're renovating something, you're changing things up, like right. you're changing a wall or something in a house. They say that that stirs up spirit if they're there. Well, yeah, you're messing with their stuff, yeah. you know. And they see it, you know. And I often wonder, and this one boggles my mind, um, is you know sometimes do they see us as ghosts? Are we the ghosts? Right. And we're infiltrators. Because we're in their home, you know. Do they see us in flashes? Does the does the veil thin the same for them? Like when we almost see them, they're almost they're seeing us. And I wondered just dis- about that because I've seen things that I don't think necessarily were there, but it was reacting to me. Like, what is that? Why is mm. that there? I passed a car one time that had an elderly couple in it, and the man just looked totally shocked. The woman looked like she was about to scream. And they were in an older, looked like an Edsel or something, you know, so elegant looking old Ford, but it looked brand new. And I'm in like this, you know, little Toyota Celica or whatever. And, but just the look on their faces. And I thought, you know, these people are lost or they're having some kind of medical emergency or something. And I turned around to the next driveway, which is just at the top of the hill, went back and they were gone. I mean, completely out of sight. And they were just creeping along. And the only place they could have went was in the lake. And I even looked to see if they really could see a car down in there. So there was no car there. But just the, the – and they were looking at me. I mean, they were staring at me with these just uh, total fear on their faces. And I often wondered if that was, you know, kind of a flash where not so much me going back or me going backwards, but they went forwards or something and they right. saw me and thought, you know, what is that? What is Who's that guy? You know, the weird-looking guy with all that hair and yeah. driving this, you know, and – yeah, and I think that's true too. I think the I've whole had other people that I didn't know at the time tell me about a similar experience on that road. One friend of mine from work in Oak Ridge was trying to get to my house one evening for a dinner party, and she took the first turn instead of the second one and ended up on that road. And she started 
describing things that hadn't been there since like the 1960s. And she was talking about, she said that big dairy farm there, that's beautiful. All those cows and stuff, who owns that? And I said, well, it was my grandparents' dairy farm. But in 1964, the Tennessee Valley Authority dammed up the Clinch River and created Melton Hill Lake and left their dairy farm, the barn and silo were sitting on a quarter acre and the rest of it's underwater. And she's like, no, there were cows and people out working. I'm like, mm. you know, oh you God. saw something. And that was the same road where I'd had the experience yeah. with uh, the people in the old car that were shocked by me. It's crazy. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, what it, what does that look like to someone like Yanni? You know, if he's stuck in in that period of time on the farm and then they break yeah. around for the Toys R Us and they start putting it up. Like you said, Cisco, is it just flashes? And they he sees like flashes of someone like basically next to a pond and they're they're doing something strange that he they're working on something he's never even seen before. And then it's just gone. Or what it's does that look point. like? Imagine if that was happening to you. You know what I mean? That's yeah. why I'm saying. I don't know how. I am so glad that I'm seeing in my time, I went from, it, uh, you know, 56 years now. Okay. So I've seen it go from nobody's talking about this. If you talk yeah. about this, it'll take crazy. All the way mm -hmm. to we're talking about it all the time. Yeah. And, now, you know, skulls are bleeding on TV 24-7. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you talk Everybody's, about, like, when we were kids, you know, going to the library and have a tree. Cabinet. Oh, there is no yeah. true ghost stories. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's true. It still section. happens. It still happens. My book. <laughs> when I tried to put my book on Kindle, first we put it on. It was getting no play whatsoever because I, I'm like, no, these are true ghost stories, but they wouldn't let me put it. You know, they wouldn't a, let you put that. No, you can't put it in nonfiction. Oh. There's no ghost category in nonfiction because yeah. it's not true. Yeah. So you have to put it the other side and just go like, it's true. It's not true then. <laughs> Not you know, sure to them but, yet because they haven't experienced yeah, it. Yeah, they had it listed in what, like astral projection and angelic beings or something. And there might be an angel story or two in there, but there's there's no astral projection that I'm aware of. Well, I don't do that, man, because I'm, I'm, I'm afraid what's going to happen. You have enough body going on. <laughs> That's what I had somebody tell me one time. She said, Well, if you're out of your body, what's to keep somebody else from jumping in and then, you know, locking the door and you're. Yeah, then hell what no. <laughs> that's hell that's, a, that's no. a, I don't even want to thought. think about that. Do you guys, yeah. I'm sorry for all the random questions, but we always do this and that's okay. Are you guys happy with the state that things are in now? You just mentioned, you know, how prevalent everything is on TV and in books and we can all talk about this now. But is that really, is it adding to it? Is it taken away from it in, in some ways? Well, I think it's a good thing because it's a new renaissance. It's almost like the age of spiritualism again. More people are aware because of it. Now, not everything out there is good. Some of these shows are absolutely ridiculous and the things that they do. Cisco likened it to, you know, you see a guy in a hole. Well, instead yeah. of helping him out, you start yelling, hey, guy in the hole, what's it like to be in the <laughs> hole? I bet you hate it. Hey, yeah. people, come here and look. There's a guy in this hole. And that's kind of what it is, these people that provoke. Yeah and try to, you know, get evidence and stuff, it's there. We already know it's there. You know, do something about it. And, mm -hmm. and I agree. But it can, like I said, this, you've got to separate the wheat from the chaff or the signal from the noise or whatever. But there are some good things. Like I said, if, if it's just raising awareness and consciousness and people are more open to it, then in general, that's a good thing. But there are people that still go about it the wrong way. I'm laughing and I want to tell you this. I will try to find a way I can tell you this without <laughs> telling you this. I went to a convention and I'm sitting there and I, 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 I went to the convention because I knew my husband was there and I can walk all day long and it's not going to bug me because I'm like walking on adrenaline. I'm like, Oh my God, there's such and such. And this is great. I can ask him this, you know, mm -hmm. I'm riding high and I know his back hurt, so I went and I got tickets to get into this one thing because the money was going to help pets, you know, uh, uh, not pets, um, stray animals. And I was like, I'm all for it. So he could sit down for a little bit. And I wasn't particularly interested in the people that were given the, the thing, but I had seen some of the shows that they had been on, and I, I knew a little bit about them. And they were experts, which... <laughs> Run, run, yeah. Experts, you know, oh, no. 
in what field? The whole thing? Wow. Okay. Ooh. That's huge. Lucky you That's, to be in the presence yeah. of experts. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. So I'm sitting there and I'm listening and I'm taking it all in. I'm going to learn something here. You can always learn something. Absolutely. And I'm getting different opinions. And finally, this one guy, he, <laughs> I just watched a show where there was animals. The animals were being abused horribly in real life. And they went back and there were some animals that were still haunting the place. And I know that when you do one of these shows in 45 minutes, the production is days before your B team goes in. It's days before they're setting up. So you're already in there messing around. Then you got your A team goes in and they do everything that they do. And then there's the breakdown and then there's the reveal or whatever it is. That's basically a show. But it's days you're in there trying to get evidence. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying it's days that this spirit of this poor thing that it suffered is answering questions or performing for your commands, whatever it is you're doing. And then they left. And I'm like, okay, I know after hearing everything you just said and how much you love animals, I'm so trying not to reveal who this is, and how much you love animals, I'm sure that once the camera stopped, you did everything in your power to help this poor animal cross because for an animal to be stuck, the devastation and the torment for that animal must have been off the charts because most animals don't get stuck. They don't have their earthly burdens that we have. They just go. You know what I'm saying? So that to me broke my heart. And this jerk says to me, actually, I hadn't got up there yet. He says out to the to the crowd, you know, um, well, yeah, and then, you know, we picked up our stuff and we left. And, you know, um, it's, it's, they, they're still there to this day. You can hear them, you know, uh, going off and doing their thing. And somebody asked him, they said, well, is it residual? Is it just a loop? No, no, we got intelligent stuff. And I'm like, I looked at my husband and he looked at me and he said, don't do it. Please don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, hold my purse. <laughs> I got there and I got behind the mic. And that's when I said what I said, you know, surely when the cameras went off, you help these, you know, you know, mediums, you know, psychics, you know, animal communicators, you help these animals, right? And he says to me, he says, we think that's intruding on the spirit's choice. And I said, but being there for two weeks, torturing these things, getting it to go on command, that's not intruding with them, trying to give them, you know, taunting them with this and trying to get them to command so you can get an EVP. That's not, you know, intruding with them. You left them. I thought they were going to carry me out of the place. <laughs> But I, but, but I left them dumbfounded. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. You, you're telling me, yeah, you know, we shouldn't. Now I get that. There's lots of people who think we shouldn't intrude. You know, we, that, that's their choice. And I'm like, okay, fine. I just told you a story where there was a guy in a bar. Four people on their own dime continued to go back there to communicate with this individual to let him know we're here to help you. We want to be perfectly clear that you understand that you have a choice at any time to leave this. You do not have to stay. This is your own self-induced prison here. You know, yeah. you don't have to spend another hundred years here or whatever. You go on and do the next thing, whatever the next thing is, you know. But an animal that suffered, do you see what I'm saying? I could have, I could have killed him with my teeth. I was and so you can just imagine if a human doesn't really understand what's happening and what's going on, think about a lesser creature, you know, an instant mm -hmm. creature that has no idea what's going on and what kind of terror and fear that that thing would, would have to suffer through. You know, that's just, that's so tragic. And they just, just kept it jumping through hoops and it was all great because they got it on film. And yeah, that's it's all probably they cared thinking, about. oh yeah, you know, I've got a new owner, I'll somebody cares about oh, me, somebody God. loves me, somebody's going to pat me on the head and feed me and scratch my ears. Hey, <laughs> hey, where are you going? Come back, come back. You know, don't leave uh, me here. And that's exactly what they did. I think we get caught up in that as a human being. Okay. I understand 
you know, we're trying to prove that something happens. We're, unless we can figure out how to make a, a, a ghost manifest in a jar three or four times, science is never going to, you know, I mean, you can go round and round with great minds. I mean, Lloyd Auerbach and Barry Taft and all these people who sat for days and studied things and tried to figure out, you know, and then come out mass hallucination. Great. You know, yeah. is that possible? I can't. Swamp gas. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not, you not to say that all their cases came out like that, but, there are actual people going through suffering, both living and dead. So if we have a choice to sit on a fence, okay, and say, this is a human being, this could be me, this could be my child, this mm -hmm. could be somebody I care about, yeah. you know, and if I can do something now to try to help that person, maybe, maybe if it was me, somebody would come help me. You know, and you can say that between helping animals or anything else, you know. I've gone without eating to feed stray animals in my backyard. People think I'm insane. And I'm like, you know, hey, it's a life. You know, and that's really what it's all about. These are, if we are talking about a human being who was once living and that essence is still existing, are they not still a human being? And why are we treating them like they're, you know, yeah, uh, something else? A sideshow freak? It yeah. yeah, so I'm very glad you asked how we felt about all this. I'm very glad that people are able to talk about it. I'm very glad that people are able to say, hey, I have an issue instead of, you know, trying to hide it. I'm especially glad about kids that are able to talk about it now and not suffer till they're teens and then try to thinking that they're freaks yeah. because they see yeah. things are things uh, and they're able to reach out and get help. That's Cisco awesome. and I had a caller on a show we were on recently. Mm -hmm where he called in, he sees things, he hears things, and his parents are they're pushing him towards psych meds. And he's like, you know, it's not that. I'm not crazy. But, you know, I sense things. And, and just, it's sad, really. And yeah. just, he was well, reaching out. And you think about that. How many people are there that have abilities that their, their parents or their caregivers or whoever uh, push big pharma on them? And, yeah, you can take enough drugs to shut the voices up, but is that really – you know, the best thing. And I'm not, you know, that's nothing against people that need those medications and stuff. Or if that works for you, right on. You know, it's it's an individual thing and an individual choice. But, to, you know, that had been like if I was, when I was a kid, my parents knew that I saw things. And they just, my mother was used to it. My dad was just like, okay, whatever, because he had had some strange experiences too. But imagine if they'd like, well, you know, we're going to pump you full of Ritalin or, or whatever, or uh, some kind of tranquilizer or a hypnotic or, uh, you know, to put you in a catatonic state. And that way, that, those things won't bother you. You know, that would have just, that would have been a disservice to me yeah, and yeah. the th no, people that I have been able to help along the way. Yeah. And then there's, there's, there's so many things and you have to do both. And I, I, I had somebody on my show not too long ago, um, a, a paranormal group that I just love, you know, I love the ones that go at it with heart and there's a lot of good ones out there. There's no doubt. I'm not saying anything against them. And then, you know, you, you want to do the tech, you want to do the investigation, you want to do the EVPs that you can frequent, you know, tell what frequency they're coming. That's awesome. But I'm starting to see a lot of the heart come back, too. I'm starting to see a lot of different ones that are putting some of the feeling back. And I'm seeing more and more of that. And I think it really is making a turn to add that back in. And I think it was accidental at first when they took everything out and just did science and tech. And yeah. now I'm seeing it back in. And I think that's awesome. And that was the thing, you know? like back in the seventies, you had uh university of North Carolina, I think it was that had the first parapsychology uh, study in the country that actually sat down and scientifically said they recreated some things. They were, uh, what's the, they, the thought form or whatever that they, I think Seth, so, Seth speaks or something like that was the, yeah. the book it's about that. But yeah. it was all just science and science based. There was no heart. There was no real feeling in it or anything. And then you kind of went to the other end of that spectrum. Now, like when I started, and I mean, I was doing what people call paranormal investigations now. I was going out with infrared film and granted a lot bigger recorders, but we didn't have the little pocket recorders back then. But I was doing this like in the early 80s and stuff, and even prior to that to some degree. So I've seen it come kind of full circle, you know, and now – Everybody's doing it. It's it there for a while though. It was the thing to do that you couldn't get on Facebook 
without running into a dozen different paranormal groups yeah. or on Twitter. If you've got anything about the paranormal in your bio, then you've got these dozens and dozens of people. Oh, I've got a group. We're investigators. We do this. We do that. And, you know, it's it's easy in this age. You can put your name on a shingle and hang there. And the thing that scares me, there's a lot of people doing that, and they don't really have any idea what they're dealing with, what can happen, what the consequences mm-hmm. can be if you get in over your head and don't have somebody to call for backup. So I there's, there's a lot of caveats that go with it. They hung on that bridge, and they've got people coming in day in and day out, you know, and, you know, here, smoke this cigarette or do this or do that. What about that? Per- that's a person. Now, not only did they have to go through what they went through to die, you know, and now they finally got somebody listening to them. You can hear me. You can see, you know, you're paying yeah. attention to me and they're just doing this stuff and then they leave. And they've you know, been able to manifest all the energy they could to turn a flashlight off and on. Yeah. yeah. And then like, OK, we got our footage. Let's go. Mm. And then what are, they're just left hanging there. You know, they've expended everything they can do. Yeah. And they did the trick that you asked for. And, and then that's the gone. end. Yeah, yeah, no, that's just not right. And I think that's hard. And I think, um, you know, it, I hate to say, you know, read the book. I never wanted to be one of those people. But there's a nice long story in there about Gettysburg that shows very much that same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, will, fact, I want to jump us. in here and say the Gettysburg chapter, even though I'm associated with the book, that is the book. You could take that chapter alone, I think, and make its own book out of it. And I just, I want to commend Cisco. I read that chapter and I had tears in my eyes. I laughed. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things. It's just, you'll go through the whole range of emotions. And if you don't, then you don't have any feelings. <laughs> there's something wrong with right. you. Right. Exactly. Because there's joy, elation, there's sadness, there's release and freedom. And just, uh, it's and everything. Think, thank you, sweetheart. And, and I mean, that's it. People don't realize how hard it is to write something like this because you have to go back over your childhood memories. You have to go back over. And I didn't put anything in there that I kind of remember. If I kind of remembered and had something to do with the story, I'd tell you, I kind of sort of remember here, but I won't focus on that. But if it means anything there, that is. Because I wanted it to be where people could read it and go, that happened to me. That's the way it sounded. That's the way yep. it looked. Exactly. That's how it felt. And that's important, but I had no idea how, how many feelings it would drudge up, and I had no many uh, how how the idea of how how many questions I would have, and how much I would learn from writing it. Uh-huh. Yeah, because you know, as I'm looking at it, I'm going at one point in time when my mom used to come visit me. That's in one of the chapters. I can't remember. I think it's we 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 are all children in the wilderness, the afterlife. That's the one I was when my mom taught me so much. I didn't think till I wrote that. I thought when I was a kid and she was, I would wake up after she died. I had to go to live with my aunt and uncle and I would wake up and she would be in my room somewhere. She'd be sitting on my bed. She'd be sitting in the chair. She'd be standing in the corner. I went over all the details, the way my cat reacted to her, how I felt. And I honestly believe the reason I woke up was I felt her pain so strongly. I would be in pain when I woke up. Mm. The detail in there is amazing. Yeah. The seashells banging against the door, the yeah. the smells, the screen door opening and closing and the squeak of the hinges, you know, that you could, it wasn't a dream. It wasn't your imagination because you experienced this whole progression of things that cat, led up to it. Yeah. The cat saw and reacted to her in certain ways. And the thing that I, that came to me when I was writing it though, I really thought as a kid, I blame myself because we used to have these discussions about ghosts. I said, I would never, I wouldn't want to see a ghost because I'd be scared. You know, when I was little, I would say stuff like that. And I thought she was leaving so quickly because I was scared and she didn't want to scare me. And I, when I was writing the book, I flipped that and I thought, what if I scared her? What if? Yeah, But see, think about it this way. I mean, I could think, okay, she was coming to watch over me and it was a purposeful thing and she did it because she was worried over me. She wanted to watch over me. That's a beautiful thought. What if that may not have been it? Maybe she was just so connected to her love to me. That's where she manifested. And when she lifted her head, she was as surprised to see me as I was to see her. And I was almost like a ghost to her. And that made me think of other things. And I'm like, okay, now I got more questions. So I can't say it was one way or the other. It might have been both at the same time. 
But these things teach us things. If you stay open minded about it, you want it to be one thing, you know, and it might be something else. And it's I heard somebody say one time, I can't take credit for this, but, you know, if you're a believer and you're living in a home, almost everything is paranormal, you know. Uh, you know, I mean, different things that happen. And if you're a non-believer and things are happening in your house, you know, you can explain it away. Yeah. You know, and it's kind of, we're all in that section there. And sometimes we just misunderstand. And I think sometimes they misunderstand as well. But it, like I said, if we're talking about human beings, I mean, there's things that have never been human that never, you know, that's a whole different ball of wax, you know, that's we should probably have an entire episode about that because things like yeah. that absolutely fascinate me. Well, honey, there's things. Now, are you, you know? Shannon, are you talking like elementals and evil it, spirits and things uh, yeah, like that? that like yeah. she said, they're oh, never oh, living, never breathing touched, people, but yeah. Okay, yeah. I, yeah. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm down. Let's do yeah. it. Let's I mean, but on. again, that's. We're not going to touch it, on it here because that's a whole I, other ball of... I, but yeah, I would love to talk to b both of you, though, you not, about that me, because Steve is is tied in with the elementals as well. So, Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, if you listen to some of those stories yes. like about the, the thing in the oh. ditch and... Uh, <laughs> yes. Some of the... What I believe to be fae that are fae people or yeah. something that I've met yeah. with some kind of... And I've been told that by people that... Had no way of knowing what I was even talking about. I had it verified by a Ouija board at a party I was at. I didn't know anybody there except for the person I was with. I only knew him just a little bit from work and did not know the girls working the Ouija board at all. They'd found it under the couch. Okay. And they were going around the room asking people stuff. And when it got to me, I said, what scared me as a child? And it spelled out water sprite. Yeah. And they had no idea what that was. They're like, you know, is it thirsty? Is it yeah. wanting some water or a sprite? And then this was days before the internet. I went to the library the next day, got the reference librarian to help me, and she looked it up and found pictures of these elemental spirits. There's a, I forget which is which. One is a water spirit and the other is a wood spirit, but there's a dryad and a naiad. And that's apparently, according to the Ouija board, what I mm. encountered there. Mm -mm -mm. And it <laughs> pulled it out of thin air. So that was. Unusual. There have been a couple other things like that. And that didn't happen just once, but twice. Yeah. To me, I uh, believe that they're about more than six that. years apart. Eight so, years okay, apart. Barry Fitzgerald has really dug into a lot of things. His last three books have been absolutely amazing. And he was actually on one of those shows. He was on, um, I think it was Ghost Hunters International or something. And I knew I liked him for some reason. I loved his energy. And once he got off of there and he started doing his own thing, he started really digging in. He went back to Ireland and he started digging into all of the, the myths and the legend. And he's got a story that, I mean, it, there was some kind of a water I don't want to say Sprite. It was a water something. It was an elemental. And they were studying it. And he got in the boat. He got in the canoe with a friend of his. And he says, we're going to check this out. And, I mean, he had the most, the experience that he had. And he was being pulled underwater by unseen things mm. and and stuff like that. He's really, if if you're interested in it, I highly recommend looking up Barry, Barry Fitzgerald. He has a whole website and books on it and stuff. No, I would love for you guys to come on for a, an episode about just, yeah. just things a little bit off of what we usually talk about. I would love that. Hey, I'm, I'm down. Cisco and I can tell you that will chill you to the absolute bone <laughs> is that there are things, you know, uh, people like to think that in some cases, some people like to think that there are things that, you know, um, that anything, you know, we can get rid of it or if we pay, don't pay attention or whatever. But there, when you have somebody go into your house that knows what they're talking about and can see things, I was much, like, again, much more gifts than I have. And it tells you that you've got something ancient on your property. Mm -hmm. that's and they waiting will reflect, refuse. That die. That you're on so your own with this one. I have no idea. I'm afraid of it. I am scared of you. I've had people tell me that, you know, that's. <laughs> Yeah. I, I wouldn't touch that with yep. a ten foot pole. And I mean, it's waiting for you to uh, die because it is or exorcist or something. Yeah. yeah, and it is when you die, it will collect your soul, and there is no way oh, out. Oh, good lord! You can. The only thing that you can do now is get off that property <laughs> and cleanse, yeah. and get the cords off, and then you're good. Mm -hmm. And then somebody turns around and go, "No, nah, we're staying." 
we're now, good. There, there are things you need. Oh. You've got to, to bind things up and cast them out. And there's there's a process that that's required to, that kills me, to get rid of stuff like that. And it and it the stuff like that exists. I mean, it it's just it, there are certain properties. As a Native American, I can tell you that when I sat sat with elders and people like you know that's been around a long time. Yeah. Tell you we don't speak of such things because uh-huh. when we speak of them, they hear you. Yeah, and I've had people tell me that. I've delved into some of the Cherokee legends. I did a video about Spearfinger that went through the roof because of mountain monsters. Well, some of the things that they deal with and talk about on there are real within the Cherokee canon of their legends. And I'm getting ready to do a video about one. Cisco knows which one I'm talking about. Not supposed to talk about it. I'm going to risk it because I'm only an eighth Cherokee, so maybe it'll shrink down <laughs> one, <laughs> to one-eighth size before it comes after yeah. me. But, uh, but things, I mean, if you're going to believe the things, you can't pick and choose. You know what I mean? There are mm-hmm. things in this world we'll never understand. We're not supposed to, I don't think. But to think that we're the only ones here is just, you know, that's arrogant. You know, look at the universe. There's so much going on, you know. And I think this is a very young planet. Again, I said I think. I'm not a scientist, you know. But it just makes perfect sense. And then you take this world. Okay, well, how many other dimensions are there? Well, if there's other dimensions, what's in those dimensions? Can they come over here? Just because we don't know how to get over there doesn't mean they can't come over here. I absolutely believe in portals. I absolutely believe in 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 time slips and things like that. I believe that if you're in a house and you hear somebody coming down the stairs, how do you know it's not you? You're not haunting yourself and you're just yeah. in some kind of time uh, thing there. Oh. I don't know if I've ever told you that story, Shannon, or not about the guy that I knew that – haunted he was basically haunting the house he grew up in he went back to visit the, his childhood home and the guy that lived there you know like welcomed to me and let him look around and stuff and he was you know this is my room and this was my parents room and the guy like kind of looked at him kind of funny and said did you ever have a problem with, with ghosts or anything when you were here and he's like no my parents had the house built new never experienced anything like that and the guy goes on to describe like well there's sometimes there's a little kid that gets in here he said at first I thought it was one of the neighborhood kids getting in through a basement window. I'd always see him run down the hallway in the back bedroom or something, and then he wouldn't be there. And it's like the guy kept listening to the description of what the kid would do and how he looked and stuff. He goes home, gets in his old family albums, goes back with a picture, shows it to the guy, and the guy's like, that's it. That's the ghost. That's the kid that I see here. Oh. And he's like, sir, that's me when I was five years oh old. Oh, my God. Oh <laughs> so my somehow, God. either through some yeah. sort of residual energy or some oh. sort of portal or time slip. And this guy, he was so attached to his childhood home mm-hmm. that when he was made to move away as a teenager, he was even suicidal. He he loved the home that much. He wow. would dream about it, sit and draw pictures of it and had planned one day, you know, that was his goal. He wanted to make enough money to buy that house back. Mm. So he just, he had such emotion and did stuff he ever buy the house back attached that i don't know i didn't oh. didn't get that far he, he had still was planning to but he hadn't got to that point yet the last time i spoke with him. somebody i knew back in tennessee i haven't talked to him in a few years but i'll yeah. i'll try to get in touch with him and see if he's back in the house that would be amazing i would love to hear an update on that story uh, but just the, yeah. that emotion and that's i think that's the same you know where there's something yeah. tragic maybe a murder or whatever there's that release and that's how you get some of these residual hauntings but that's the first one I've ever really been aware of where turns out I figured out it was him when he was small. Is, is that yeah. a time slip? Is that a portal? Is that a glitch in the matrix? I have no idea, but it's absolutely uh, fascinating. I've got a couple of them like that. The one that chilled me the most recently, a uh, real tough lady, real tough lady. Um, just uh, everything that means. Okay. She's in a paranormal group and she goes in. Now her group goes to this one place where supposedly a serial killer has buried a lot of his bodies. That's that's the legend, okay? And they're doing that normal thing where you go out there, you know, are you a victim of such and such? Are you here haunting this place for, you know, this reason? That Just the normal things that you would do as a paranormal investigator, I guess, calling out things like that, mentioning this guy. This lady got an attachment from going out there now she's got problems she brings it home she's having bad problems in the house 
um, to the point of being woke up, pulled out of bed, bruises, beatings, uh, scr- uh, scratches being thrown across the room, the whole shebang. You know, she's having these problems. Her family is now having these problems. Uh, pets, three dogs, all suffering because of this. Okay. She gets somebody who really knows what they're doing. They look into it has no idea what she's done or where she's gone or anything else says the person that she's got attached to her is the serial killer. Oh, wow. Okay. That serial killer, because she was in there talking about it so much and calling about him and talking about him and researching about him, attached his energy. His energy was so strong. Attached his energy to her, was able to haunt her, pull her out of dreams. Oh, shit. She saw him standing in her bedroom more than once and didn't know it was him. He's alive and in jail. What? Like, yeah. (laughs) What? (laughs) Oh, my God. And then I've got another similar one. I knew some people, some kids, they got in touch with something on a Ouija board. They thought it was a spirit. And it was a guy claiming to be in a coma somewhere he yeah. didn't remember much because he'd had a very traumatic head injury mm-hmm. but he said he, he knew he was in a hospital but he didn't remember much about his existence before couldn't remember his name or what state he lived in or where he was at but he said i'm in my body i can hear doctors and nurses mm-hmm. i can hear people talking that i assume are my parents he said but they're not going to come in here and say you know my son john smith how are you doing today you know so he's like i don't really have a clue Mm -hmm. and he was trying to get these people to help find out where he was so he could get a message because they were talking to me he was on life support and they were talking about pulling the plug Mm -hmm. and he's like you know find find my parents find out where i am don't let them kill me but i don't know how that ever turned out So I think that can happen. It's not always dead people that that you come across with some of these things. You guys are a a treasure trove of stories. I mean, are you going (laughs) to write another book together or what, you know? You want to tell her, Cisco, or should I? We've got a fiction fiction book that we're working on this time. Oh, cool. Yeah. And there's other other true books in the works. Tell, tell them about what we've got going there, Cisco. Yeah, before we run out of time, we need to make sure that we plug everything here. Really quick. The, this is a gift for all your listeners. Go to Steve's uh, 13 Past Midnight YouTube channel. I'm sure there's going to be a link. Now, what it is is the cabin is the prequel. I did this on a bet. Somebody said, you know, you know I said I can write one of these stories. And I wrote one. Steve needed extra episodes for his uh, 31 Days of Halloween. So I said, let me help him out. I can do this. And I wrote a little fiction story. And it, it was probably 30 minutes. And then I narrated it and did all the voices and all the cool stuff. Right. It was fun. And people said, man, this is a good story. You know, we'd like to hear more of it. So I said, hey, Steve, why don't we do why don't we pull an old Charles Dickens? I said, I'll do a serial, you know, a series. And we'll leave a cliffhanger at the end of each one, and we'll do a little episode. So now this thing's going to be a book. It's called <laughs> It's called I'm Having a Blast. It's totally fiction with lots of real places and real things that are going on in this state. Mm-hmm. And I put them all together in one. There is everything in this story. I mean, ghosts. You've got ghosts, you dog man, hillbillies, moonshine, uh, an elderly couple <laughs> that are kind of clueless. There's Nerd. everything in there. I had just everything, but it's it's really cool. And like I said earlier, I believe in Tulpas, and I, you know, Steve's always told the story about that guy who wrote the the the, the I shadow, can't oh. shadow, where he wrote so much Walter about Gibson. it. The shadow started showing up, like it was like he manifested a character. I can understand that. This is my first shot at fiction, and I'm having a blast. I can tell you the lint in the pocket of these characters. You get to know them. You know what I'm saying? And the amazing you, thing, I'm going to brag on you here, Cisco. She is writing this all as it comes out of her head. She didn't plot anything out. She's not working off any notes. The story is just falling out of her. It's the most organic 
complex story and she's got all these different storylines and different people that she <laughs> switches but i've never seen anything like it i it may be like automatic writing or something cisco you may have a spirit control in your hand as you're writing this right i really do that's not a line i really think i do because i mean i'm writing stuff and then i read it and i'm crying and i'm going oh my god <laughs> very cool <laughs> and it's kind of where you go back and like did i really write that because i've had that happen before okay well yeah. Yeah. Beyond that, though, make sure to replug the the book that we talked about that you guys co-authored uh, in the beginning, and also your separate projects that you're working on. Okay, Journey Through the Gate Paranormal Portal podcast. We had a little hi hiatus. I apologize to my listeners; they know my husband was in a motorcycle accident. I had to get like two jobs, and I was like crazy, but we're back, and um, that's on YouTube. It's a new YouTube channel sent the link to shannon mm -hmm. and uh, the book is we are all children in the wilderness of the afterlife a guided tour through a haunted life it's got a banging cover promise you <laughs> it cost me dear but it's mm -hmm. beautiful cover, and it i'm holding it right here in my hands and it smells like a book it's awesome <laughs> don't <laughs> get that in the candle <laughs> I, no. it smells like a it smells like barnes and noble it's Absolutely uh -huh. awesome. But see, my words are they're gonna last now. Steve pushed me to do it. I did it, Steve. Get off my back now. And <laughs> <laughs> you took me with you. I, I kept saying, write a book, write a book, write a book. Finally she said, Okay, if it'll shut you up, but you're coming with me. That's right. So that's yeah. how I got involved with the the color commentary, if you will. I went along behind each chapter and, and commented and told anecdotal <laughs> stuff. So but it turned out that's great. I'd never written with anybody and it, it was just just one of those things. And it's, your it's project, our, Steve? Uh, I'm on YouTube. I'm last year we were on here. I said I may have something coming up on YouTube that turned out to be very prophetic. I've got a channel 13 past midnight. You have to spell out the 13 uh, on YouTube.com. Uh, I started out. I didn't really know what I was going to do with the channel, but I ended up narrating stories from my books. And I found out that I enjoyed it. It gave new life to my stories that now I'm writing things just to narrate. And those will find their way into a future book. So full circle there. Um, sometimes I sit in with Cisco. I produce or co-host with her sometimes on a Journey Through the Gate Paranormal Portal podcast. Uh, the dates kind of change on this. But right now, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I host a live show on YouTube in the mornings on Dizombified's channel. That's D-E-Z-O-M-B-I-F-I-E-D. -E -E and uh, got a wonderful host that I have on there with me, a protege. I'd like to shout her out, Tanya Jones. She's from the UK. She has a YouTube channel, Unicorps Tales. We just put together an amazing channel trailer for her today. Uh, she directed and narrated it. I did the artwork, the script, the editing, everything, and it's it's so awesome. But she and I have the, the show together. We have guests on we talk everything on there. We've had Heather Mosier, uh, your weird writer on your yeah, blog there. She's been her. on uh, two or three times with us. She's an amazing guest. People like that. We're trying to go around and get people that are different, people that have never uh, done anything. And uh, Heather's got some special announcements coming up that I, I won't give away any surprises. I'll leave that up to her. But because I got her to narrate – one of her stories for me she had never narrated before that led to something very special that she's going to make an announcement about at some point and uh, i'm also i'm on twitter uh strange and odd is my handle on there i'm on facebook i'm on instagram don't do a lot with that one uh, i've got some film projects in the works i've been approached about the rights to my first book i think i was talking about that last year Mm -hmm. It's in the works again. I've got some other things I'm working on with some cable channels that I won't name. And then I've got some offers from uh, other countries to come and be a speaker. And the person is the the head of the Paranormal Speakers Bureau for this particular country. So I'm excited about that. I've just got to get my books out in paperback. But uh, speak it all into existence like I did the YouTube thing last year. So yeah, look, nice. look for Steve Stockton in a lot more areas. I've had an amazing year since the last time we were on, and this one's shaping up the one ahead. It's shaping up to be an even wilder ride. I love hearing yep. that. Well, and if you guys, you know, I know that we do this every year. We're going to have the 5th and the 6th and the 7th, God willing. But in between this and the 5th, if you guys want to come on and talk about more uh, 
untethered, unearthly beings. I would love that because I, I don't think I really, re- I've never really had a really focused show about that. And that's why I was kind of bringing up things like hell and what you guys thought about things yeah. like that because that's a, and a lot of it is conjecture, but I love conjecture on this show. And I, I think that you two would be fantastic to talk well, to there, you about that. It's so. an area where conjecture is yes. really all you have. There are no hard, fast rules. Right. Other than, you know, Hogwarts or something, there's no place you can go to study elementals. Right, right. Yeah, yeah you but to, you two, uh, you are, to I mean, I mean that you're, you're, and you're, you're two is, this, I've seen it. And I can tell you, I've felt the ultimate good. I've, I've seen it. I've got pictures, you know, I've seen the miracles and I've seen the devastation of the other side too. So, yeah. you know, I mean, if you're going to be on the fence, be on the fence, but if you're going to jump over, pick a side. <laughs> well, I'm going to pick a side. I'm going to be on you guys' yeah. side. How about that? <laughs> you know, cause it's, shoo, man, it, it, it can get ugly out there. And that's why I worry about some of these people going out there. Like I said, that one lady, she was just talking, you know, I mean, how in the world? And if, and if a human being that's still alive and in a jail can attach somebody and do that yeah. kind of harm to a human being, what can something unleashed do? Mm. And we're just that's, talking. That's like movie stuff there. Of course, they're usually dead. I mean, that's a Freddy Krueger or a Chucky. Yeah. Or some, you know, that, that's why like I that. would love to but do a person, separate show. Yeah, that's that. the scary part. Yeah. That because person. if he can attach to her, can he attach to other people at the same yeah. time? Could he have an army of people that he's attached to? That just boggles mm-hmm. the mind. A couple other things I did want to mention since this is going to air on Halloween. My book is free today until midnight, Halloween night. It's free all day. Uh, Amazon.com, Strange Things in the Woods, More Strange Things in the Woods, and My Strange Life. Those are all free today. I do that once a year for Halloween and for my birthday. Today's my birthday. And uh, also, I'm doing a 24-hour stream, which is going on right now. After you listen to this show, go over on YouTube and check it out. And I've been doing the 31 Nights of Halloween. I've uploaded a new video on some paranormal topic or a legend or a creepy story every day this month there'll be 31 of them up there by the time you get to hear this they're all good he's doing a phenomenal job and if you can absolutely get on his channel and check out the cabin that was my birthday gift to steve Mm, it's It's amazing and i usually don't do fiction but this was just the most incredible story even when it was the first chapter i was hooked from even the prequel the cabin is the prequel and then the uh Strange Secret of Cabin 22, parts one through four, and probably five, maybe up by the time you get this, I'm not sure. Yeah, but it's, now. If it's not there, it will be yeah. uh, on Halloween or shortly after. And then there may even be another part beyond that. I'm not sure. I'd have to defer to Cisco on that one. It's, it, it, I'm, I'm thinking six. I'm thinking okay. six and we're out. I mean, but, you may as well. But- Right? So I, if it's that good, a, a why, why stop? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, double trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> that's probably don't, a, don't a mess silly. around with this. Keep going. Trilogy, but that Say. sounds like something dirty. But. <laughs> don't want to jip people either. You know, when you start out with a writing style, you don't want to jip people. It's a just, new hashtag. Okay, it was a dream. You know, it was all a dream when he woke up. That, Six that, I would yeah, be, it's, that. You won't be disappointed. And I've had this, people that sit down and listen to one episode and you're just hooked. You've got to find out. You've got to find out what happens. These characters are so real and they're all so different. There's not any stock characters or any filler in there. Everybody plays a part that's integral to the whole thing. And then she weaves all these individual storylines together into the big story. And I just, I am in amazement. I think she's channeling somebody or something there. Definitely. But I'm not going to jip the, the the listeners. It's going to be solid. And I've and, and for two weeks, I've gotten to run around the house, say, leave me alone. I'm killing somebody. So, <laughs> the other busy. day, she was up at 6 o'clock right. in the morning writing. And she said, yeah. my husband and my son have been making coffee and pushing it towards oh. me with a stick and running. Yeah. Because I'm up at you know 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning writing on this story. She's like, I better be strong. Black coffee, damn it. <laughs> I, have, I have shit to do. Yeah. <laughs> And I get to ask him questions like I asked my husband, if you were, you know, if you had to die like this, <laughs> it's like, would you Oh, fall? my God. <laughs> I can see Mario's eyebrow going up like, hmm. Yeah, I but I'm pretty sure he's it. used to stuff like that by now, right? Yeah. I mean, come on. Well, hey, he I, a- I love you both. Thank you so much I for doing you. this I'm again. Sure. We're going to do this pleasure. again before our next oh. All Halloween episode because we have to talk about the untethered, unearthly beings. 
Um, but mm. I thank you guys both so much for your time. That's it's awesome. always a pleasure to talk to you. The listeners love you. I love you. So thank you so much. Love you too. And we Just love remember, the listeners. Thank you. The covers and your closet door shut because there are things that go bump in the night. Yeah, Happy bunch. Halloween, everybody. Well, I'm so and so. I was given this name by my parents. I've been to such and such a college. I've done these things in my profession. I produce a little bark. Buddha says, forget it. That's some of the story. That's all gone. That's all past. I want to see the real you you are now. Well, nobody knows who that is. Because we don't uh, know ourselves except through listening to our echoes and consulting our memories. But then there's a real evil, and that again leads us back to this question. Uh, who are you? That is the real evil. We shall see how they play with this exam by the cohorts to get you to come out of your shell and find out who you really are.
down in the train to read your newspaper and uh, so on. You are not the same person who uh, a little while ago left the platform. If you think you are, you are linking your moments up in the chain. And this is what binds you to the wheel of birth and death. But when you know that every moment in which you are is the only moment, this comes into Zen, the master will say to somebody, oh, get up and walk across the room. And he comes back and he says, where are your footprints? They've gone. So where are you? Who are you? When we are asked who we are, we usually give a kind of recitation of a history. Straight, 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 straight.